Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is TWIT, This Week in Tech, episode 595, for January 1st, New Year's Day 2017. What a year it was. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Bowl & Branch for a good night's sleep. Try their ultra-soft, 100% organic cotton sheet sets. Get $50 off your first set of Bowl & Branch sheets and free shipping by visiting bowlandbranch.com and entering the offer code TWIT. And by... Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. And by Sonic, Twit's 10 gigabit fiber internet service provider. Join Sonic's internet revolution as they bring fast, affordable internet, phone, and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Visit sonic.com slash twit to sign up for service and receive your first month free. Hello, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Tech, kind of a special This Week in Tech. Uh, I decided to give the team the week off. Uh, it's New Year's Day. No one's going to come in to work anyway. And, and we certainly wouldn't be able to get any hosts. But fortunately... There's a lot of good stuff we did uh, over the past year, and we thought it'd be kind of fun, as we've done in years past, to do a best of episode. So that's what we've put together for you uh, today. Kicking it off, uh, Oh Doctor, who's always a fun and wonderful guest on the show. He he's just a hoot, and uh, you probably remember back in November, he was a little teed off, shall we say, about Apple's new MacBook Pros. Listen. Actually, it's in the other room, the new Apple uh, MacBook. We did an interview yesterday on the new screensavers with Kyle Weens. He's at iFixit.com. And as you know, iFixit does teardowns of uh, all of the uh, new stuff whenever it comes out. They did a teardown on the new MacBook. It's kind of part of their mission, which is to kind of make uh, repair manuals, tools, and parts available for everything. So one of the things they do when they do a teardown is they rate these things on how easily... You can repair them. The new MacBook got a repair factor of one, repairability of one. On a scale of what? Out of 10. The lowest. He, I said, could you go lower? He said, well, I guess you could get a zero. But could you not, in fact, see that as the best? Like it's number one? <laughs> Maybe that's what they meant. That's like what Tim Cook says. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, but in their, in their, move, in their haste to make thinner, lighter, Notebooks, what Apple's really done is make notebooks with that there is it's not upgradable. You can't add it's RAM. a big iPhone. Is what it's a big it is. iPhone. It's exactly yeah. the model. Even down to the point where not only the battery is not removable, they're so heavily glued in. Kyle said it was almost impossible to get them out. We had in, in infinite patience that it's also, and this is the thing that really bugs me, not recyclable. He says, really? Uh, yeah. He says, we hear from recyclers all the time who have fires from lithium ion batteries. They're either left in by accident or we didn't find it. Uh, and when they grind it up, of course, as with any lithium ion battery, it explodes and it bursts into flame. And it's a real problem for recyclers to the point where this is going in the landfill. This is not going to be recycled. Wait. So, Apple, I remember years ago, Apple getting heavily criticized for like burning down the earth and being bad citizens of the world but they came back and they're like oh no but we do this and we have our new building is going to be lead certified it's a spaceship it can take us to mars if the earth ever melts <laughs> down like i remember that press conference yeah and, and, and so they're and they're a member of ep you know and their stuff is ep certified but i have to think it has a little bit to do with the millions of dollars they gave ep more than the sustainability of the electronics here's what i'm going to propose by the way, it's not just Apple. It's everybody. This is the Google Pixel. Sealed battery, right? Uh, now, I'm, it may be possible to take it apart and take the battery out easily. I don't know. But I think increasingly the drive towards thinner electronics is driving us towards sealed cases and batteries. Remember the days when you could take the back of a phone and replace the battery or pop 
the battery out of a of a laptop and put a new one in. I mean, the battery goes bad in uh, you know a few years anyway. Yeah. These are they're essentially making disposable electronics, and this is an awful big chunk of disposable electronics. I'm, but are you sure that Liam can't take the battery out? Liam cannot take the battery out. And by the way, so I asked that. And Liam has a very particular set of skills. Yes, he does. Not, it's like an iPhone. Uh, he was meant Liam, for Liam is not ready for Westworld yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked uh, Kyle, uh, well, doesn't Apple recycle these? Because you're supposed to bring your old stuff back to Apple. He said, I know the recycler that Apple uses. And oh. no. And wow. so, so here's the issue. That's a crime. Man. Going forward, I think we as consumers, for our own benefit, because replaceable batteries are good for us. It keeps electronics lasting longer. If you have a cell phone with a replaceable battery, you can put a second battery in. And it's good for the environment. Shouldn't we start demanding not thinner and lighter, but removable batteries and recycling? First of I, all, on, I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, doctor. Sorry. Oh, doctor. First of all, I hate this new laptop. I hate this new direction that a Apple is going into. They're not going into the, the Pro series when people used to create content. Now they want a Pro series for you to consume Yeah, this is content. basically an, and, an iPad with so a keyboard. Well it, Can you and, just repeat so, that, O'Doctor? I want to take these people to church. Can you repeat that? <laughs> Preach, O'Doctor. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, uh, let me just, I'm going to just go and then I'm going to stop. You make a laptop with only C ports in it, and then you put a headphone jack in it. After you just told me that you were magically getting rid of my headphone jack that I try to put into this iPhone 7 Plus repeatedly. Now, why is it in that, and you can't have a way for me to just plug my phone into my laptop and charge it when I'm on the go and I got stuff to do? And instead, now I have to pull out this dongle and look like a doofus. But you couldn't put an SD card reader in it because you told me aerodynamics. And I'm thinking, this dongle is aerodynamic? Everything is wrong with this thing. You told me, I, have, did you, <laughs> you see know, the DJ another, with the little scroll bar? No, don't let, I'm not done. Did you see the DJ with a stupid little scroll bar? I got any professional knows how to use the function keys to get around any of these pro tools that they're using. It's so insane the things that they're doing. I never miss Steve Jobs. I thought to myself, he's a man I ain't never met. I don't need him, but I miss him so much because it's so ridiculous the stupid stuff <sighs> that they're doing. And if you wanted my grandmom to have a MacBook Pro, then maybe you shouldn't charge three thousand dollars for it, you stupid <laughs> doofus. I don't need it, and it makes me so mad because I need a new computer and I'm have to go back to Microsoft because they're the only ones I can. I tell you something. Did you see oh. that? Sexy 28-inch tablet that you can roll down and scroll know, down and write on with. Where is Apple's innovation? Y'all ain't got no magic. Y'all ain't got no courage. And I'm going to stop yelling because people get mad because I yell on the show. But I hate it so much. It makes me so you know, sad. Just, <laughs> Apple please, junk. Leo, Leo, don't just, we need a moment. We just need a moment of silence to appreciate the Bill Cosby mixed with Homer Simpson <laughs> rant that we just heard. <laughs> oh, my God. It was... <laughs> that was the most beautiful thing I've heard on this show in years. Oh, Doctor, I want to find you and hug you, but I know you're in a non-disclosed black site operated by the city. Right? To the city for you, so I kind of don't want to find you. That was amazing. Dude, it, it hurts my heart. I need to spend three Gs on a laptop, and I can't bring myself to do it. I need one, and I can't do it right now because I'm so upset. And I don't want to go back to Microsoft. I dumped her a long time ago, but now she out here looking sexy to put on a cute dress and lost 50 pounds. <laughs> I, I so, bad. so <laughs> I have I have no words. <laughs> Amazon's rent a Buddhist monk service causes controversy. In Japan. <laughs> Is that an actual headline? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Mashable, you. ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no, wow. it's a real story because apparently it's very expensive to get a Buddhist monk for your memorial service. Um, ah. Monk delivery service from a temple is about $830. A funeral could be as much as $8,500. So Amazon has jumped in to this market with oh. cut-rate Buddhist monks. Is this monks? So as it's a service? not that you're renting the a The name of the rent. service yeah. is Mr. Monk Delivery. Oh, Mr. God. Monk Delivery. Obo Sanbin. Is there a Mrs. Monk Delivery? No, there are no Mrs. Monks. Yeah, oh, that's, it that's, that's trash. Apparently, this is a big moneymaker for Japanese uh, Buddhist temples. Uh, so they, they, yeah, they did a lower price. The Japanese Buddhist Association is up in arms. Yeah, but you know what? As, as they you... should be. This is terrible. <laughs> totally I mean, just acceptance. Acceptance. 
if the you, Amazon service is a mere three hundred dollars. Yeah, but you know what? They're going even lower. There's the Amazon Basics monks, <laughs> which are like they, they speak in the, the same voice. Do they come with frustration free wrapping. It's just like the Amazon cables. It's the same as the Lightning cable from <laughs> Apple Store. It's just like half the third of the price. You want and the basics? There's the gold plated monster monk as a service, which Absolutely. costs ten right. trillion dollars. Exactly. <laughs> huh? And either way, yeah. the oh, that's what we need is the Amazon Dash button for, yeah. for a monk. Order a monk. <laughs> At some point in time, there's going to be eight people outside like you called, and we're going to be like, crap, Leo, get your credit card out. By the way, about 100 people listening right now just had their <laughs> say, oh, you're talking set a timer. About. Set a timer for five minutes. Stop it. <laughs> Buy more socks. Do you know how annoying that is? <laughs> oh, that's really bad. <laughs> Play Barry Manilow. Oh, you are dying. <laughs> right in blood by Slayer. Okay, we're going to bleep this whole damn segment. <laughs> Hey, Alexa, can you just, Alexa. Uh, Christina, Alexa. get these boys out of here. Tell us a joke. <laughs> uh, Leo's hair color. No, no, if you, if you do a <laughs> tell me a joke, oh, it does it. It'll it also do a, a other stuff. Like, a, 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 you could say <laughs> fart. It, but you, have <laughs> to turn, you have to turn it on. Oh, you do. But it's one of the skills. There's a section <laughs> called skills. Ah. That's one of the so did you say <laughs> turn on fart and then... Fart? Um, something like that, yeah. Okay. Turn on the fart. My, my favorite one, ex, so. uh, my favorite Bonk. feature is the switch accounts. So if you you can put yes, two accounts right? in, I so use it's it like, for Audible. Yeah. It's amazing. So like my wife has her Audible books. Exactly and I have why mine. I did it. Yeah, and so we swap accounts. And when I want her to read my book, and when she wants to read her book, my yeah. daughter my daughter goes, play rock and roll music that'll make daddy angry. And I'm like, does it work? I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking? There's no rock and roll. I it's love it. very I love play rock. like some smooth jazz or something. That'll make this me is upset. why kids today have such a problem because yeah. their parents, they're, they they yeah. love all the stuff. You want to you want to tie your hair purple and make a mohawk? Go for it. That's wonderful. Play Rick Ashley. Never gonna give you up. Rick <laughs> Ashley. Ashley. I'm just from the chat room. Shout out. Or just to, Alexa. Uh, just Rick. Just Rick shout out to the Geek 007. You just Rick rolled uh, everybody listening. It is the greatest show. device ever. And I just, it is. It's my favorite. One of my my, my favorite. My favorite device of the year. year. I think it's the best device they've ever made. When the government breaks a lock, and they're doing it in the in in the physical world, that is one lock. Like it's constrained by 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 the. Even if you even if you want to take like an example of a golden key, like if you want to like the TSA luggage, um, brouhaha. Like uh, you know, TSA now luggage has to have a TSA approved lock, which has a can be unlocked by a particular set of keys that that only the TSA has. And then someone stupidly took a picture of it and put it on Twitter, and now you can 3D print the the, the, the key that can unlock mm -hmm. basically all the luggage in the world. It's a great example of the problem with golden keys, that they do leak, and when they do leak, then now everyone has access. To every single luggage lock in the world was weakened immediately, all at the same time. The difference is you still have to get the key and go to every piece of luggage and unlock it, one by one by one by one. Like there's a physical constraint on what can be done with with a golden key. The the real danger with a digital golden key and this idea that there, I mean, the only way that you could build and the only way you could fulfill this law, the only way is that Apple has or or Google or WhatsApp or any service, Amazon, and this again, this applies to basically every single company that does anything over the internet, period. That every single company has to retain a key that can undo their encryption but the difference is when and if that key leaks and these things do leak and again you don't design for the best case you design for the worst case so you presume what happens if if, if this key leaks if this key leaks not only is every single piece of software and every service and everything that that touches immediately vulnerable but it's vulnerable in a way that can be taken of advantage of immediately and at scale yeah. because that's how digital works like some bad guy in some Eastern European company or in Russia or China or, or, or in the U.S. or wherever it may be can immediately compromise and take advantage of that weakness in a matter of minutes. Yeah. And that's very different than having to go to every single piece of luggage in the airport and lock them one by one. Like the, the degree of risk is massively, massively greater. And you put that in an equation where figure out who has the most to lose. Who has the most to keep secure? If you were, did, a, did a census of every single country and every single citizen and every single company in the world, who has the most to lose? And if you put this in a ledger and you weigh it out and you balance it out, it comes out that the United States has the most to lose of any single country in the world. And instituting an environment where 
the you're hoping you're basically your security rests on hoping that stuff doesn't leak or doesn't get out, which the history of everything shows never persists and over the arc of time will get out. That's what happens. And that's why you design security for the worst case. You don't design it for the best case. So when and if that happens, who will be decimated? It will be us. It will be the U.S. And that's the argument that we need to win on, not calling them idiots, even though they are. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, been, it's, it is tremendously satisfying to call these people wankers, but you're right. <laughs> know, it doesn't yeah. advance the conversation <laughs> I, I, in any way, shape, or form. You said I, on Twitter you were going to, so I had a while to... I had a while to <laughs> <laughs> you baited him into it. You made him do it. Uh, um, it just... Yeah. I, yeah, I would love, though, to ask... Senator Feinstein, what do you, you know, what's your thinking here? Now, remember, these two are ranking members of the Intelligence Committee. Maybe they know something, you know, maybe they, and they probably do have a good reason to be very worried and think that, well, you really need to do something about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're being told by the intelligence agencies that they are going dark and, you know, right. but we seem to forget that, you know, before smartphones, we did have a pretty good record at catching criminals, you know, it wasn't Yeah, what impossible. did we do before phones? Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we've, we've had encryption now for decent encryption for, for decades and we're still catching criminals, there are still stupid people out there. Um, it's just... It's that mindset that this will make law enforcement's life easier, therefore we should do it and we should ignore the consequences. And as you say, the, Ben, the, the consequences of this are absolutely huge. If the government's OPM department can't keep its senior yeah. fingerprints and securities clearances safe, if Microsoft can lose its source code, if Google can suffer serious outages, you know, I mean, there is no way to keep an escrow system key safe. And if yeah, you're going to introduce that, I mean a de deliberate flaw into the encryption... China, Russia, malware writers will do a Manhattan project to find out what that is and to exploit it. Yeah, oh, just to be clear, you can design a golden key that cannot be discovered. I mean, it, it's a, it, like, the problem is the golden key can and will leak yeah. or can and will be discovered. I don't have, it, actually, that is one thing Google mentioned that I think is, is terrible. You know, they've got their own now Amazon Echo clone that'll be out the Google Hello someday in the not too distant Google future. Home. Home, rather. Allo, home. And uh, one of the things, uh, one I think was somebody said, I think it was Google, I envision a day where you have a bunch of these on your mantle and you're talking to all of them. No, that is not no. the day I envision. <laughs> I do not want that. I want one thing. I talk to that one thing, it talks to everything else. That's what we want. I want Scarlett Johansson and her. Yeah, the other problem with the um, Allo idea is that you're inserting an agent into like one-on-one -on -one conversations. That was one of their demos uh, where you're like, hey, to your significant It would answer other. for you. Yeah, or, or you would bring it in to schedule your dinner reservations or something. And I, I saw that and I thought, no, 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 no. When I have a conversation with one other person, I do not want a bot in oh, between maybe us, though. right? Wait a minute though. Maybe there's people that you, you know, bug you and you could just say, okay, Allo, handle Talk to them. the bot. <laughs> you don't even tell them. You say allo handles because you know inbox has that. this great auto answer thing. Mm -hmm. I've been using that more and more. Uh, it it looks at the email, it learns how you respond to things, and it's it's uncanny. It comes up with responses I actually use almost all the time. A lot of times I'll write more, but if allo's like that, yeah, this I is can only imagine that uh, my wife and I start a discussion, and then it ends up allo's talking to itself. Yeah. <laughs> Where'd this new calendar Honey, event come from? <laughs> Yeah, what? How do you, are you still talking to me on that? No, I'm not. I'm not either. What are they saying? They're having a conversation. I think they like each other. Google thinks we should go out to dinner. <laughs> yeah, magic calendar. Just, yeah. Uh, I've scheduled something for you. <laughs> I'm telling you, Skynet, it's coming. <laughs> uh, Facebook, of course, working on AI as well. I think Facebook and Google do have an advantage in that we've already given them so much of our uh, personal information that they at least know my name. You know, uh, Siri is a little of a disadvantage uh, there. Facebook is um, starting to do digital vision, vision artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Both Facebook and Google have open sourced a lot of the code that they're using, hoping that others will work with their code and start uh, improving it. This is kind of the, the benefit of open source. The disadvantage is you're giving away company secrets. The advantage is if you've got cool stuff, like a TensorFlow from Google, people will start using that. And then we'll all benefit. 
Worried about Skynet? Are we getting closer? See, and you said there was nothing going on. But See, this is the story. No, but Harry said on. it was AI, and I think mm -hmm. you're right. I think, but it's but it, but 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 both of you are right. It's you know it's distant. It's not right now, except that this could be, you know, the iPhone in 2007. Right. Could well, be. I mean, we're going to keep using it, and it'll and we'll complain about right. it, and we won't even notice how much better it gets because right. we're it's still not quite good enough. And then one day, it will be, we'll we'll just wake up and be like, oh. It's good enough now, or right. the world will end and it'll be Skynet. One of those. Allo will we have, have both. Uh, incognito chats. It'll have, everybody does this now, uh, expiring messages. Everybody's also doing uh, encryption. Yeah. A point to point encryption. Uh, in Allo's case, as well as Facebook's, you'll have to opt in to it. It's not a default. Apple's is default. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing that uh, the security people ding Allo for is that you yeah. have to go into secret mode as opposed to just having everything be encrypted. Hey, at least you have a secret. Yeah, you know, it's good that they've got one. It's just, you know, by default, it's not secret. Yeah. And that's because uh, App or Google wants to be able to do its thing and process process what you're saying right. and in, come in with a, a bot to help you out. Unlike Apple, they're going to use uh, a well-known open source solution, the Signal Protocol, which is vetted and tested. Uh, it won't have the problem messages uh, has. Unique keys for every participant. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, your assistant won't work anymore now because you're encrypted. But you know, yeah. that's it. That's the that's the trade-off, and that's why it's not on by default. Right. I I I completely think that's fine because uh, most of the conversations you have in messaging do not need to be secret. Honey, what's for dinner? Well, you know, will it's you, a secret. Yeah. Why are you trying to find out what I'm my not, dinner what, is? <laughs> <laughs> no, true. It, it's just I, I think the idea there is that then out of habit you uh, always do your right. things unencrypted, and therefore there there's always been that argument, right? Back in the days of uh, everybody doing PGP email, that you should encrypt everything, or right. or HTTPS instead of right. HTTP on the web. Just if you encrypt everything, then everybody's ev happy. Then everybody's and happy. And it's not a red flag anything. to the NSA that Saying, you're you must be up to no good because you just turned on exactly. encryption. Yeah, I use PGP. I sign everything. And if somebody sends me their keys, then by default, my our conversation will be encrypted, thereby making sure that we're uh, every conversation will be in the NSA database. Yep. Um, I don't. You know what? They're, who cares? Because it's just as dopey a conversation in, under the encryption as it would be if it weren't unencrypted. So uh, one of the tough things for us to deal with uh, this year on uh, Twit was politics. Uh, we aren't a political show, we're a technology show, but there has been all year long kind of an intersection of tech and politics. Uh, this was shortly after the election. We had Lauren Hawkinson and Alex Wilhelm on, along with Mike Elgin. And frankly, I had just had enough. <laughs> uh, this was my response to Trump's latest tweet. Um, this it, also wonderfully dovetails into the fact that all of this, uh, especially in relation to the way that um, tech companies are seen, especially the internet as a common carrier, uh, could be radically affected within the next four years. Are you uh, talking about net neutrality? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, net neutrality. Well, oh, Tom oh, Wheeler, save me. All right, stop, because this is a second conversation we can't have, which is what a Trump administration will look like to tech. Sorry. My reluctance to get into that is it's an unknown. Mm -hmm. And we can say what he said uh, in the campaign. I think he's already backpedaling on some things. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, th he said inconsistent things about a lot of things, H-1B visas. I'm not sure what his policy is because it's not written on his website and the, his public statements have been inconsistent. I mean, the guy was a Democrat three years ago. We don't really <laughs> know what is going to happen. Uh, of course, one hopes that the most misogynistic, racist things that he said and encouraged were inappropriate rhetoric that he will abandon but we don't know and so what i'd like to do and maybe i maybe that's wrong but what i'd like to do is defer judgment until such time as he he says what his policy is i think on that's the fcc i think it's instance. reasonable but given the people that he's bringing into All it, his does is it, gets, it, it just gets people ginned up mm -hmm. over something that hasn't happened yet okay but can we frame it like this then given that trump is now the head of the gop he's their their actual leader well he's the He's actually, I would argue with Paul that. Ryan. I don't know who the head of, I don't even know what the GOP is. In the, head of the GOP was just made chief of staff. The elect. standard bearer He's is, the president-elect. He wins. It's not a parliamentary system where the the head of the party is now the, the prime minister. The nominee of the party is generally regarded as the head of the party. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I think this is a new era. And I sure. don't know if we can say all, that. All, all I'm trying to say is, if we, we can I think it's very likely that mainstream Republicans will reject 
what he does in office. That's a possibility. But I do think when it comes to policy things that have been on the books of GOP dictates for a long time, we can look to them as a preamble of what he may do. No, I, think that's I don't think you can. I don't think you know. Kids, was I that, think was it's that too far? No, I think that's too far. I think it's a complete mystery. I can guarantee you the Republican oh. establishment is going... Okay, so, but, okay. <laughs> when, let what's me, he gonna do? Let me try one more time. There was a, or a story that came out about two days ago reporting on the first meeting between technology and business leaders in the tech sector and the Trump transition team, and they discussed how they'll approach policy in the Trump administration. Is that close enough to be accurate to talk about? Yeah, but that, well, no, okay. because that's a discussion. I, I would like to see actual actions, and then I'm, believe me, I'll take to the streets. I don't have a problem with protesting actual actions. Okay. I have a little bit of a problem with protesting something that hasn't happened yet. I think Ajit Pai is probably next in line to be chairman of the FCC. That probably doesn't matter. We don't know. You, wait till that happens, will you? No. Because I want to gear up now. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Yeah. You're, you're 59. Gonna be on this, you're going to be on this show when that happens. He's, he but might not. Can no, I, but you're, can I but you're, 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 you're giving me? yourself an ulcer over something that yeah. might happen. Absolutely. And I will take an ulcer. I'll take it twice. Allow, allow, me, to, allow me to step into the batting cage. For a minute, sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag in here, um, and and I think that this is something that we can discuss, which is, are you ready? Yes. Which is the idea? No. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so Trump has gone on record to say that he opposes the FCC's open internet order. This is something that he said, but he just he said, it. okay, wait a minute. He said it in a tweet, and he in said which that, he said it's compared it to the equal. Uh, what was it, the the uh, FCC rule for equal media access? Yes. Fairness doctrine. Yes, the fairness doctrine. That was in a tweet two years ago. I don't know if he still thinks that, if that's what he's going to do. And I think debating Donald Trump's tweet is an exercise in futility. Okay, what I was going to Total say is- futility. What I was going to say is, however, he seems to also feel sympathetic towards net neutrality in the sense that his interpretation right. of the open internet order was actually a knock against anti-net neutrality. I know. Power grab. Now, He's we'll also said he wants to end the Time Warner acquisition 18, yeah. by AT&T. Yeah. So what do we got? We don't know. Let's wait and see. I'll bet you. Well, I'll bet you, but it doesn't... <laughs> You can't debate something he might do. That's it, You can't. There's nothing to debate. Well, I mean, we can talk I think it would be a good thing if he stopped AT&T, Time Warner. I think it would be a bad thing if he over or he appointed somebody in the FCC who would overturn the uh, net neutrality. Mm -hmm. We can say that, but we don't know. He hasn't done Let, it yet. Let's, let's talk about what has happened. This is a complete shift, and I hope you don't mind about this. <laughs> in 2008, uh, eight years ago, I wrote an, a column that flatly <clears throat> I'd come to the conclusion that social media determines elections. At that time, President Obama's running for office, and I said, he's got more juice on social media, he's going to win, and he won. And then every major election since then, I've looked at the social media, number of followers, the amount of engagement, et cetera, and in 100% of the cases in major elections, whoever has the most juice on social media wins, and, and clearly- this, this one wasn't even close. Wasn't even close. This but, one, this one, uh, Donald Trump uh, is, for master whatever else, a master Absolutely. of the media. And so here, here's the question. Is the social media simply determine, the, is success on social you know, media how you get elected? It can't, it, I think it's, uh, it's simplistic uh, to say it's that thing or another thing. Mm -hmm. You can also say he was very good at getting mainstream media to cover him because he was so good for ratings and they mm -hmm. got billions of dollars in free television coverage. You could also say, you could say a lot of things. Reality TV. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we should oversimplify and I'd see a lot of this. Well, it's it's all uh, it's all Comey's fault, or it's all Bernie's fault, or, right. and it, you know what? It's a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know if anybody will ever know what was the reason. It could well be that Hillary Clinton was just not likable enough. Mm -hmm. It could well be that well, we've had eight years of a Democrat. It's time for a Republican, which by the way happens. I think we with can all, regularity. Yeah, I don't we, know what it is. But we can agree that CNN shouldn't have played so many Trump rallies in prime time, unencumbered by commercials. Certainly helped him. Certainly helped, that, and it helped them, by the way. And Les Moonves, chairman of CBS. No, but Zucker said that he was he, that they should have done that. So, he, so Zucker's only moment of contrition following the the election was that, and I think that's kind of a telling lack of uh, self awareness. Les Moonves, chairman of CBS, says it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. I should buy some stock. <laughs> to read about the new Uber. I guess this is in New York. Uh, mostly, uh, is it called? Oh, oh right, the local one. Yeah, yeah, is it Juno? Is it what is the name? Yeah, of something it? like that. Yeah, because I should try that tomorrow. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, you're going to New York. Yeah. So yeah. there was a good New Yorker article about them, and Baratunde told me about him. He says I don't use 
Uber anymore because it's exploitative. Uh, I want to use Juno. Now, Juno is started uh, by the guys um, who started, oh, they, they sold Viber. They started Viber, remember right. that? Yeah. For $900 million. So uh, the founder, Tom and Marco, said he thought, well, I could sit around and just, you know, enjoy life or I could take some of that money and start another company. He looked around and he said, you know, we could do we could do what Uber's doing better. Now they're kind of cannibalizing Uber because they're going after Uber drive the best Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. If your Uber score, your your rating on Uber is over uh this is something out of a Black Mirror episode. If your Uber score <laughs> is uh, over 4.7 out of 5 stars, you can apply to drive for Juno. In other words, if you're mm -hmm. one of the best, they'll steal you away. Although many drivers do both. Yeah. And you get a higher percentage, right? Yeah. Uber takes I'm 5 thinking. to 25% commission. Juno takes 10%. Um, and what's happening with a lot of Uber drivers are getting squeezed. It started yeah. out great. And then, yeah. then, then Uber takes more and more and more. I took an Uber the other day. We were in uh, Florida. And I tried to give the guy a tip. He says, no, the company doesn't let me take tips. And I said, oh, my friend. Yeah. You are so wrong. <laughs> Uh, they don't let you tip within the app like Lyft does. They pretend but, that you're getting yeah. tipped. I always assumed Uber was tipping the driver. And they told drivers you may not ask for a tip until the driver sued and won. Yeah. That's the and shit. now Uber drivers can ask for tips. I told them, not only are you allowed to take tips, you can now ask for tips. And don't believe what the Uber guy's telling you. No. I mean, Uber <laughs> has a, a long record of treating its drivers terribly badly. It's exploitive. They're yeah. on the record of saying that basically... They're just hanging around until the automated car comes out, right. and they're just going to dump all these bye drivers, drivers. anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a very it's it's not a company I, I, so I choose. Lyft to allows you to tip within the app, and what I like about that is I'll tip after I get out of the car. When I'm at the end of a ride, what I like about Uber and Lyft is I can just get out of the car and leave. I don't have to fiddle with my wallet. Yep. But I kind of feel bad because I do like to tip if I get good service. But it Lyft lets you do that at any point after the ride's over. I felt guilty because I have never tipped Uber drivers, assuming that I didn't have to. I know, and I don't carry cash. One of the reasons that I really like Uber right. is that I don't Press need to. I don't need to worry about having cash for a tip. Ever right. since I've ever since yeah. that that court case, I have now automatically yeah. tip. I carry yeah. cash, and and then maybe you should try it. So, Larry, when you're in. The Big Apple. Try Juno. Try Juno. So I, as a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, I've got a, a 6 a.m. flight, and Wait. I don't trust Uber or Lyft to actually have a driver in my neighborhood available to pick me up at 4.30. So Lyft now lets you schedule. I actually right. have a Lyft reserved. Right. I think I'm paying a little extra for that. But it's it's a relief to know that a driver will be there at 4.30 in the morning, uh, yeah. and I don't have to worry about it whether It's nerve-wracking, isn't it, that you yeah. could just assume, well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to press a button and a guy will come within five minutes yeah. at 4.30 in the morning. Maybe, maybe not, and you don't want to miss that flight. Palo Alto, nobody in their right mind will be driving around <laughs> Palo Alto. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's the thing. Even with Juno and Lyft, I worry mm -hmm. about in a few years, it's clear that uh, all of these companies want to do a, autonomous vehicles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Uber's, these jobs are not going to exist in five. Oh, then, then you'll pay extra for the the human touch, right? That'll be you'll there'll be like an extra fancy, you know, our driver mm -hmm. knows the way to go, but it will it will push the bottom what ninety percent, eighty percent of the drivers out of the market. Exactly. Right. Eventually. Yeah, yeah, and considering that driving is one of the most, uh, I think about three and a half, four million Americans are now. One point uh, one professional percent of the drivers, workforce is uh, professional drivers. drivers. And wow, they're, they're going to be out good of truck drivers. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a All huge number uh, nice. that's going to have to... Uh, and truck drivers are going to be yeah, yeah. hugely impacted by it because that's one of the areas that might actually get covered sooner because right. it's mm -hmm. so much more efficient to not have people, you know, human beings who have to do things like sleep and eat. Yeah. Well, we saw it just uh, a, a few weeks ago, Otto, O-T-T-O, which is an Uber company, delivering, mm -hmm. uh, what was it, 7,500 cases of beer well, uh, Budweiser, so calling it beer is no, a bit course. strong. It's you know? course. Right. Oh, it's of course. Well, you, oh, well, that makes wanna, it perfect. You, know, like you want to have, no, the, you, you want the beer right. in the in the robot truck to be something you could lose and yeah. not really worry about. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's important. So I don't, I, I wasn't going to get into this today because this is kind of a deep and difficult to understand, a parse topic. But it is very clear that income inequality is a growing problem. That's clear, right? Mm -hmm. Um uh, and, well, and the and hollowing the, out of industries, and right? And jobs yeah. are going away. And I, you know, uh, even if you are able to get carrier air conditioner to stay in the United States, it seems highly unlikely that industrial jobs that have been lost will come back at any point. No, right. Um, you can talk about 
and uh, some do retraining, teaching uh, people to have skills that are more in need. But it's very clear with the advance of machine learning, artificial intelligence, that we're rapidly getting to a situation where even jobs like mine, mm -hmm. that one would assume require human skills, won't be available in the years to come. So that leaves a very interesting question. There was an article this week in The Atlantic, A World Without Work. This is Derek Thompson writing. And this is an issue that a lot of people are starting to think about. Actually, I apologize. This is a year old. Uh, yeah, I've read that. That's a, that's a really great piece, though. This is, this is one of those issues that, you know, the, you have this... Our, our economy, in some ways, has never been more efficient, but it comes, uh, it, but it's employing fewer people, mm -hmm. and that's the challenge. Is if you if you lose another one percent of the workforce, are they going to Where outlaw they going? robot they trucks? Go? Probably not. So I think Donald Trump is going to get his his campaign eventually. Maybe not during his administration. He will fulfill his campaign promise of bringing jobs back to the United States. But the problem – I'm sorry, bringing industry back to the United States, not jobs. So, yes, Apple is going to start – eventually they'll start making devices in the U.S. But it will be with robots. Even with Foxconn robots. in China has exactly. replaced 30,000 people with robots. So, yeah. right. And it would, it, it, you know, especially if energy continues to be cheap. Why not put a plant in the middle of the United States, closer to the consumer, if you don't have to well, employ there's, anybody? Well, there's actually interesting economic reasons for China, for Apple to manufacture in China. It's closer to the sources mm -hmm. and the suppliers mm -hmm. of the pieces. Yeah, it's the so supply right. chain. It's much yeah. easier yeah. and cheaper to assemble in China. Not, It's not about labor. The labor addition, the cost of labor that would uh, change no, about $5 yeah. between making it here and making it in China. It's not about the labor cost. It's about the right. a access to suppliers and being able to adjust raw what you get from the supply chain and just in time moment by moment so yeah. that you can minimize your inventory right. and all those things that, that Tim Cook, for example, it made his that's name his, at. That's, yeah. his, that's, that's what, what he does. Yeah. Yeah. He was COO logistics. and that was, yeah. 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 So I, I think that, that we will probably make able, be able to reverse some of this but in the but the long term trend is clear. These jobs are, mm -hmm. are not going to even exist in China. I mean, it's not that yeah. these jobs are fleeing to China; they are going to disappear thanks to automation, right. machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that's what this article says. But the thing that uh, this article wants you to think about is: Do we even need to work? And this is why psychologically it's very difficult. Historically, mm. we associate uh, who we are with what we do. Mm -hmm. Without my work, I don't know who I am. Yeah. And so right. psychologically, Mark Andreessen has addressed this, the Netscape uh, billionaire. He says, don't have, you don't have to worry about income inequality. You don't have to worry about job loss because there will be such a surplus, thanks to automation and machine learning, that there will be enough to go around and you actually won't need to work. That we so can all have a basic, state? essentially, uh, yeah, that's oh, a basic, bad word, basic welfare. Basic income idea? Welfare, yeah. But, yeah, the idea, and Mark is, a, now there are problems with basic income. Huge problems, it, yes. It, chief of which it, it replaces uh, in other entitlements like uh, medical insurance that won't be covered in the long run by basic income. But, but let's assume we could fix mm. that discontinuity. If there is a, a surplus, maybe in the future we won't need to have jobs, but we'll have to psychologically adjust who we as. Are. Right, and the idea of basic income. By the way, if you've seen the sci-fi series The Expanse, they mention that from time to time. It's part of the universe. Right. There is that Earth is a is on a basic income at that point. Right. The idea is you don't have to work just to survive. But if you want anything more, if you right. want to buy survival guarantee, clothes that don't come out of a machine and food right. that doesn't come in cubes, right. then you then you choose to work. Right. And the idea there is that we could all end up being more productive if we can choose what we want to work on, and it could lead humanity to interesting places instead of sort of fighting to uh fighting to to do just enough to survive it is also a bit of a utopian vision and there's yeah. a question about whether it there's could also, actually work there's also the service economy and by service i don't mean just working at mcdonald's so we had a flood in our house in july and we've had workers here constantly for the last several months you know putting walls in and painting and doing things that cannot be done currently by machines and, and admittedly, so but spending a lot of money. Some Very, of the you know, these part guys, of the problem yeah. is that these jobs may, in fact, exist, but pay so little, yeah, and be so grinding and grueling that they, in fact, don't raise you above the poverty line. In fact, the minimum wage in the United States does not raise you above the poverty line. Right, but but doing carpentry work in Palo Alto, at least at, at the guys that we hire, is seventy-five dollars an hour. Right. Mm. Which, if you didn't live in Palo Alto, is a pretty good wage. 
I mean, the problem <laughs> is to live in this area is so high. But I mean, I, what I'm saying is that there are still jobs out there. In fact, I think this whole home automation thing that we're in right now, the IoT thing, requires skilled people to to know what to buy, to know how to install it, to know how to configure it. And I do think that there are service jobs that are going to be emerging over the next few years. They may not last forever, but but there will be uh, some opportunities for people. And many of these jobs don't require a college education. Here's yeah. from this uh, Atlantic article of last year. The most common occupations in the U.S. are retail salesperson, cashier, food and beverage server, and office clerk. These four jobs are about 10% of the labor force, 15 and a half million people. Each, according to an Oxford study, is highly susceptible to automation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, yes, admittedly, there will be people working. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that podcast show hosts will not be yeah. eliminated <laughs> by automation. <laughs> However, even if you have 10% of the labor force not working, mm -hmm. you have to address this issue. And uh, I, I, would, I would submit that this is a clear future at this point. Mm -hmm. So we really need to think about what does that mean? The FCC is the ultimate lame duck agency at this point. In, uh, in a few weeks, January 20th, the new president will get to nominate a new chairman of the FCC. In fact, Congress has already said to the FCC, don't do anything. Well, the FCC is already, yes, they stopped. They, they stopped, stopped doing, doing stuff. So this must be like a leftover. Well, yes. And this is something, I mean, Tom Wheeler is banking big on net neutrality being his, actually protecting consumers' rights, which he's done a really good job of. He is not uh, the dingo that we thought he was. He is He is not. Um, so yeah, this is so frustrating because this is what everyone said was going to happen when we allowed zero rating. This is yeah. not a surprise to anyone. Yeah. And, oh, look, it's happening. And AT&T and Verizon, by by ignoring T-Mobile and not going after the, the first mover, the weakest one. Because T-Mobile started this with their Binge On program. Binge On and zero rating for Spotify and some things, which everyone's like, hey, free Spotify. We're like, no, well, this, this is, is the, like. This is why it's so hard. Zero rating is so hard because customers love it. Right. What they don't understand, and it's I feel like I'm preaching at them when I say this, is you. it's not good for you. <laughs> You shouldn't, I know you're not paying anything for listening to Spotify, but the problem is the next hot, new, exciting music service is disadvantaged. You won't listen to them because they cost you bandwidth. So in effect, right. you're telling John Ledger and, and T-Mobile, you guys get to pick who the winners are. And we don't want T-Mobile to pick who the winners are. We don't want AT&T to pick who the winners are. We want the market and consumers to pick who the winners are. Did I describe that accurately? You were Very so good. Right. I'm so glad I didn't have to do that because I would have just gone Part of the running. problem is the, is the term net neutrality is terrible. Yes. And I wish we could come up with a better name. I keep thinking uh, maybe net discrimination or bandwidth discrimination. Network freedom. Well, it's for freedom, but it's against discrimination. It's, yeah. But discrimination, they, the, they, they got that... They took advantage of that word because discrimination in the FCC sense now means a lot of crazy things. But on this story, so AT&T with direct TV, that's their own service. So they're basically like, ooh, you belong to us. And that's why the FCC went after them. So with T-Mobile, right. T-Mobile wasn't being as egregious. Well, it is. It's doing, worse. It's worse than AT&T. It is way worse. Yeah. Yes. But it's, it's not like really Comcast. worse because ultimately the whole problem is picking winners, whether it's you or somebody else. And we don't know what deals T-Mobile's making with these companies to get zero rated. Zero rating is, by the way, another terrible phrase. These phrases are chosen to obfuscate the problem. Mm -hmm. Because the people in their marketing departments are great. Uh, AT&T sponsored data. Uh, right. So with this, I'm just, I'm so sad because... AT&T, even if the FCC does go, even if the FCC had the, the ability to go after them, which I don't think, given the people who are in Trump's transition team, that's going to happen. AT&T and Verizon will fight like hell to make sure this goes through. And they fight the long game. I mean, the fact that we're still talking about net neutrality. I know. How, 
How long, Ulm, has it been since we've been doing net neutrality? Like 2008, 2009? I mean, before well, I 2005 think, was the term was invented. Or I've been writing about this since day one. And it's so nice to see two other people talk about stuff that <laughs> you know, made my head explode. I just uh, signed up for the free trial of DirecTV now. And it's supposed to be a free seven-day trial, but... Uh, the, the pro, I wish I could show you. I should. I maybe I've hustled through this. Oh yeah, here we go. So uh, this is supposed to be free, but and it's very confusing. Lock it in. Pay thirty five dollars every month. What? No, wait a minute. I don't. Should I press the continue button or no? What am I paying for? Add to plan, but I don't. It's supposed to be free. Okay, continue. Prepay will hook you up. No, what? I'm supposed to be free. Oh wait a minute. This is free. Prepay three months today. It's free, right? Credit card. I'm not giving you a. What the hell? So this is, by the way, just if you, in case you think, oh, no, at and is nice. They wouldn't screw anybody. No one thinks that. Oh, I can't continue without giving him a credit card. Well, that's so that's pretty common on free trials. Total due to wait, wait a minute. Total due today, $105. That's common on free trials? Oh, that is not. That is not. Total due today, $105. That's Wait a minute. This is time. It's time for me to make this big and, yes. uh, and to use my Telestrator. Total due today, $105 due today. That's not free. Scroll down. I want to see their TNC because oh, AT&T has the best. You are weird if you want to see that. Okay, well, all right. If no, because hey. that's when they're going to tell you what you're paying for. Compatible device and browser required. Residential customers only available in the U.S. No, only okay, so Puerto the free Rico trial US. part. Free that's... trial. New subscribers only. Cancel before the end of the trial. So which automatically renews monthly at the rate yeah. and effective sign-up. Minimum $35 a month. And it's charged your payment method on file until you cancel. View, modify, or cancel at any time at DirecTV. Now, once canceled, you can go to DirecTV. But, but, okay. but, okay, but, 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 but total due today, I, this is that... not free. $105? How did it get to that? Yeah, where did that come from? <laughs> Your seven free days will oh, be added to the end of your free... Wait a minute. Your seven day will be added to the end of your prepaid period. You'll be charged $105 today, and your regularly monthly payments of $35 a month will start on March 11th. That's not free. Yep. You... That's what they count on, That's AT&T. I love them. There you go. We like, just hey, I... need your info. Give Thank us you, your man. info. Info. I want your info. Terms and conditions. Will they ever cease to amuse? All right, coming up in just a bit, one of the most moving moments from this year on a twit. But first, a word about sheets. I know you probably don't think a lot about your bed linens, but let me tell you, I bet I can even remind you, you know that uh, the moment when maybe it's at a hotel, uh, maybe it's at home, when you have a freshly made bed and you've got really nice sheets and you're tired, it's been a long day, and you and you crawl into bed and you just, it may be one of life's greatest pleasures. It's simple, right? You just go, oh, that feels so good. I get that every single night because I have bowl and branch sheets. Bowl and branch sheets are 100, I love them. They are 100% organic cotton. And that's one of the reasons, sometimes sheets are very, um, it's almost scratchy, right? Not with bowl and branch. These soft, cotton is super soft, and it softens over time. So you just, ah, oh, you just, you just feel like you're being pillowed by these sheets. You'll also feel good. Your conscience will be pillowed. They use sustainable and responsible methods of sourcing and manufacturing. And now, normally, sheets cost a, good sheets like this cost a lot of money, like a thousand dollars in stores. But bowl and branch sells direct to you, so there's no markup. There's no middleman. So you're getting basically what is what is wholesale prices, what the department store would pay for the best luxury sheets. Instead of a thousand bucks, it's a couple of hundred bucks, and a portion of every sale goes to fight human trafficking, which I think is really great. Just check them out. Thousands of five star reviews, uh, articles in Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, even three U.S. presidents. We won't say whom. But even three U.S. presidents sleep on ball and branch sheets. Buying bedding is inconvenient, but they make it easy to order from home and receive it beautifully packaged. And when I say beautifully, this is suitable. You, the package that I got looked like it was a wedding gift. If you wanted to give this for a wedding gift, it would be 
so welcome. And it comes in a beautiful box with a big satin bow, a ribbon around it. It's perfectly, beautifully wrapped. And by the way, free shipping. You don't pay extra for the wrapping. And you could try it risk-free for 30 nights. If you don't like it, send them back for a full refund. You won't want to send them back. In fact, within 30 days, I was ordering more. <laughs> it was like, I want this all the time. Bowl and branch. Now, the spelling's a little odd. It's like a cotton bowl. B-O-L-L. B-O-L-L, not B-O-W-L. B-O-L-L and, A-N-D, you know how to spell that. Branch. Bowl and branch. Get it? It's like a, you know, it's a cotton thing. Bowlandbranch.com. Uh, do use the promo code TWIT and you'll get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets. Bowlandbranch.com, promo code TWIT. We thank them so much for their support of This Week in Tech. I know it's, uh, you probably, I hope you got everything you asked for for Christmas or Hanukkah, but if you didn't, this is a good gift to yourself and anybody who happens to join you. <laughs> Bowlandbranch.com slash TWIT. All right, this is, uh, I mean, Twitter is a, a lot of things. It's always, it's always fun, of course. Uh, always thought-provoking, I think, this show. Um, and sometimes it's very emotional. Sometimes we laugh a lot. Sometimes we cry. Uh, this is a moving moment from um, one of our regulars, Owen J.J. Stone. I mentioned him before. This was a show, a jam-packed show. Uh, Siva Vaidyanathan Vaidyanath was there. Jeff Jarvis, Jason Heiner from Tech Republic. And I think at the last minute we asked Owen uh, to join us uh, because we were talking about race relations and things got a little heavy. Uh, oh, doctor, you're my favorite guy. You move out of the township, you move to Petaluma, we'll take good care of you here, all right? <laughs> Man, I, I need to move to the state oh. that you own so I can take care of things. Here, Lena and Leah, say hi. Happy birthday, Lena. Happy birthday. He's he's yelling happy birthday. Happy birthday. Your card's in the mail. <laughs> Put the card. stamp on it. Up. <laughs> happy birthday, dear. You happy to be nine? Yeah. Last day as an eight-year-old. You know what that means. No, I don't. No, neither do I. <laughs> hey, Leah, let me, how let me how ask long you, is the birthday festival question, going Leah. on? Uh -huh. Leah, do we call the cops? No. Okay. <laughs> what do we Go call ahead. them? We don't call them. She calls. We have a, we have a system in place where, depending on what's going on, she calls her mother or she calls my mother. Wait a minute. You've Go trained ahead. her not to call the police? When she's with me, yes. And that's what my last day was going to be. I hope to live in a wow. world where I don't have to teach my daughter to do oh, things like that. That's going to make me cry. Wow. I, oh. I want to live in a world where it's okay when she's with her mother to call the police, but I fear when she's with me. Um, I've been pulled over 30 times in the last two years, and I'm a very, quote-unquote, friendly, speakable guy. But in the last four years, I've had three of those cops pull guns on me where I had to de-escalate the situation because wow. they were just out of control. And I fear that if she ever, if something happened to me and she called the cops and she had fear in her voice, they might show up, see her. I'm, I'm out all the time and people think that I've kidnapped a little white child. So I wouldn't want a cop to show up and her be upset and think that I'm the aggressor and something go wrong. So depending on the situation, she calls her mother or she calls my mother. And then they get to make the decision on whether the police are called or not. And I don't like living in that world. I don't like living in that reality. I just want everybody to be somewhat more responsible and respectable of other people's feelings. I, I want black people to live. I want police to live. I mean, I can't say blue lives matter more than black lives, but all lives matter. But right now, it, it's it's a very dangerous time. And I just want people to realize that it's also a great time. I'm sitting here with Uncle Leo. You know, he done sold my inheritance. And I plan on taking over for him in the near future when he retires. And things <laughs> will be positive. My daughter is beautiful and she is healthy and she is driving me crazy. And those are all good things for me to be happy about. So even though I'm upset, you still got to be happy. I just want the world to be a little bit different sometime soon. <laughs> Amen, Yes, sir. man. Truer words ever said. Yes, Thank sir. you, Owen. We go from uh, serious to silly. Apple uh, opened a new store in San Francisco this year with, like, its own trees, like a garden. And I don't know what happened to me, but uh, I kind of lost my mind. Watch. We sent somebody down to shoot some video of it. So this is their 15th anniversary store, and they're redoing all the Apple stores. I think are going to look like this. It has a forest, a little garden grove inside the store. What? What are you hateful? What do you have against trees? <laughs> it's not Leo, a store. It's <laughs> they Leo. call it not the Genius Bar, the like Genius Grove. Tiny... 
You can go out it. and get some I free basil. I think it's basil. a great idea. It's community. <laughs> free basil. It's community. This is a Leo. place where people can just hang out and no, chill. And no. I think that that's what people are missing. This is... People are so sick of buying things online with computers where we can actually go there and actually meet other people and hang out and relax and not have to feel any pressure. Have some cool Apple products hanging out in the background. You can check out the nice... Beautiful rose gold, but relatively useless <laughs> MacBook. Um, and just enjoy. There'll be music. There'll be bands. There'll be artisans. You can go there and have a meeting. There'll be places where you can hang. This is an area where we can actually deal with community and, you know, have Apple products in the background. I think it's brilliant marketing. And those 42-foot, you know, glass doors opening those up so that it becomes part of, it's no longer a store, it's just an area you can walk in and forget where inside is and outside is. I think it's great marketing. That's my thought. Oh, on <sighs> Leo, 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 you are so wrong, Captain. Oh. Get off my lawn. This is this is technology no, 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 as a no, lifestyle. No, this is exactly no, what's wrong with Apple. No. See, you don't understand the way the world works. We live in a world where we're jaded by everything digital and beepity bopping, and you tell kids don't go outside. Well, the trick to get them to go outside is to bring the outside to inside. <laughs> Put a grove inside the store. And then, there's trees yeah. in this place. Have you not been to Japan and seen bonsai trees inside of a room and the spirit and the essence of life and the feng shui? You don't know nothing about feng shui. Oh, I'm telling yeah, you. I don't want feng shui. I want a gosh darn computer. I think they're selling a lifestyle that is bogus. It's BS. Listen to the love in George's voice. You can't even. We believe it. That's all that matters. I don't believe. All, all that love, love in George's love voice. You. you can't even fight that with your grumpy old man. Get off my lawn. I'm bringing you a bonsai tree next time I come out there. I, no, I ordered now. a bonsai tree. I got the floating one on Kickstarter. I'm fine on bonsais. Is it, has it arrived? Not yet. Probably no, will never. It's he's, a, grumpy. he's just grumpy about trees, Owen, because no, I he love didn't trees. get bonsai yet. I don't so. want to conflate trees with commerce. Trees are trees. They should be in a so. forest. Go in the forest. That's fine. This, is, young, this, this is a store. Be, Beyond just the aesthetic, what has changed from the experience? I mean, that's the largest They're not question, selling right? stuff this anymore. They're, they're, <laughs> right. They're, that's what's changed. They're trying to make it an app. I'm, I'm not kidding. I find this yeah. creepy. They're trying to make an <laughs> Apple lifestyle. Uh, this is this is taking the brand too far, in my opinion. It's a trend in the world. If you go to Asia, they have cat and puppy shops where you just walk in and literally drink coffee with somebody's cat because you want to feel <laughs> things and be outside. And this is what you want? This is what you, you want know, for the world? Is coming from I the guy wish who lives for the hobbit cave, right? days of Leo Laporte when you used to work out of a cottage and had some spirituality and the essence of a tiny box. Now you got to this big industrial warehouse and you think that you're on top, mister? Well, you're wrong because I heard the love. I'm going to put some trees in here and then you'll be visiting the twit forest you better do it and, 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 and also so in your will put your thing as an urn as a plant so you could be planted as a tree no, when you die i love I trees i love plants. nature you just Trees. I think it's that you just don't want to go to a store to hang out with other people because you're done after it's doing cultish. all these podcasts. You're done with people. I'm going to put my <laughs> sneakers and my white running shoes and my white track suit on, and I'm going to sit there and say I'm waiting to be taken up to Steve's land. It's cultish. It's weird. It's creepy. They're selling that's, computers. They're making – the, they're fetishizing this stuff. But I don't think so. I think that they're giving something back to the community where if you have a small startup, you can go there and hang out and actually deal with business. If you, you know, it's going to have like the little tiny open union square thing where you can just sit there 24 seven, not buy anything, listen to music, have free Wi-Fi, drink your latte. I think you that's what they want. Buy anything at all. Yeah. It just makes it a part of the community. It's kind of giving back. Whereas, you know, yeah, we could say that like, you know, the echo where you're able to sit in your house and you know, no longer even have to leave the house for, you know, getting. Yeah. Like, but wait know, till, wait, remember, we have a massive homeless problem in San Francisco. I was just about to say, wait till, the no wait, <laughs> wait till the homeless people start coming in. Are they going to let them sit around? No. <laughs> well, they, they just had a problem with that out here in Philly with uh, Philly. Jesus uh, went to an Apple right. store and, <clears throat> Apparently, he went on there on a day when there was a new manager. Somebody didn't know what was going on, but he goes in and charges his phone every day. He's a homeless guy that walks around dressed like Jesus. He has a big wooden cross. Everybody knows him. He's harmless. But uh, they actually got him arrested, which did nothing but raise his profile. And he got to speak to more people about being Philly Jesus. Um, to your point, I know I was yelling at you, but I'm kind of joking. They're doing it all to sell things and to make more money. Yeah, it's all it's all marketing. Like I said, they're really great at marketing and invoking a feeling. Like I said, if you listen to the way she was talking, she was pleasant and she was happy and it it, it, it invigorated emotion in her that's what they do and as far as letting homeless people in they they it's they need to but i highly doubt they will uh, of I, course I, you know. they're not
I I had that incident my own incident with Apple and uh, yeah. Sandy. What's that? Forerunner. Yeah, in L.A. So Apple is, uh, you know, they're going to have to tiptoe around that because uh, that, that Philly thing got a lot of buzz out here. And people were upset because, again, it's something that the guy did every day. And they, they actually let him go in there and charge his phone. They didn't do anything about him. They had a, I guess they have a time limit or something, how much time you can spend in the store if you're not doing something. So I, I, I just think I this they is... They probably don't unless, like, they probably noticed that he didn't look the way that they were hoping that he looked. So well, that's kind of my point, I, which I is... I hung out for a full day in an Apple store. They said nothing. Yeah, of course not. That's my yeah. point, is that you're yeah. welcome as long as you're part of the cult and you're yeah. kind of in the... In the you know, but if you look like you're... You know, a little weird. Bye bye. I don't know. I just feel like it's a. It, it's nice. All is, right. It's isn't fine. That, isn't that every store though? Isn't that every place you yeah, go yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if it's you don't, fine. If you don't I, have yourself put together. They yeah. kick you out. Yeah. Or they don't want you in. I, they don't I should you. suddenly bring a tree. <laughs> we got. I don't know. You it's a pussy a willow or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then they got yeah, players. Like, yeah. Well, look at that. This place. Yeah. It's already looking oh. more welcome. See. Wow. Welcome to the Apple Grove. Now we feel it. We feel it. But yeah, it's, I think it's great marketing. I think it's going to work well for them. I think that it's a nice idea to be able to have a store where it's not unwelcoming and hopefully it'll be welcoming to everyone. I doubt that that'll be the case to that. But yeah, I like the idea of it just being open. You can just walk in. You don't have to worry. It's not going to be one of those stores where you feel like you go in and everyone's staring at you and you're not, you know, able to enter there and be able to just chill out. And I think it'll be great Apple, for their brand. And yeah, Apple they did this for marketing for sure. Apple doesn't do that anyway. You just, you know, I mean, there's people always in there playing with games and yeah. apps and stuff, and they're never really trying to sell you anything or help you with anything unless you ask them because there's 42 million people just floating about. So it's already yeah, got there. Again, it's just something else to market for them to say, oh, look what we're doing now because you haven't come into an Apple store in the last three years and our numbers are down and we're going to launch this new thing to get you back in. I drop my three-year-old off at the, the iPad table and I just go to work. And, exactly. Uh, the daycare. Exactly. It's daycare. Take care hey, for the tech Can we do that? Can we do that as a Fox and Friends thing? Like, just set up some go cap, some GoPros, <laughs> and you just drop the kid off and just see how long it takes for her. Like, look, uh, the kid's been here for four hours. Can we got a sippy cup or something? Like, somebody, right. Right. Like, like, let's, yeah, let's see how long they notice. Minecraft. Four hours. Yeah, this is yeah. I got this much screen time. I actually, <laughs> I forgot. I, there was one more Google thing. <laughs> <laughs> what? <Sorry>. There's. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more Google thing <laughs> I want. I do want to mention is that they announced that Chromebooks are going to be running the Android store soon. That's amazing. I think that's interesting. Does that, that, does that, does that excite you, Owen? That pleases me to no end, especially like if I can use Instagram on the computer yeah. instead of having to use my phone. Oh, happy day. I'm buying me a new laptop ASAP. It makes ASAP. the Chromebook very interesting. And they did mention... Oh. That it's selling more now than they sold last quarter. More Chromebooks were sold than Apple Macintoshes. Well, they're probably selling a lot of those to schools and things like that. Uh, uh, they Leah are. School it's like got, a, it's the number one computer in schools now. Yeah. Yeah. Leah, Leah School just got a whole new crop of them, and they went. They used to have the old Dell desktop things that were just horrible, and then they oh, we just bought all new Chromebooks. So everybody's got a Chromebook now. So I'm sure they're killing it in the uh, educational market. Yeah. Well, what is the future so of Chrome OS? Is well, I feel like this is the future. Of, yeah. In other words, the, more of the question is, what's the future of Android in some ways, right? Because uh, right. um, although I guess you still need Android for a touch device, a phone, or a, actually, you know, here's what the question is, Clayton. What's the future for tablets? Mm. My wife was, Lisa right. was asking me this, is, well, are they going to still sell tablets? If you can get Android apps on, the, on your Chromebook, what do you need a tablet for? Because you don't want a keyboard and you don't and you want the touchscreen, you want the portability. I mean, having a Chromebook is cool and all, but the whole reason tablets are awesome is because I don't have a keyboard attached to it. Somebody when said, I'm on the go, I take my tablet. I don't dislodge my laptop. Even even my Air, I got an Air sitting right here too. Yeah. I barely even take this thing out anymore unless I'm traveling. Yeah. You see, it's I'm I'm the opposite now. I don't use my my tablet anymore because like my MacBook, it's like as thin. And almost as light as a tablet, but I appreciate the keyboard. If I have to write, you know, a long email, tapping on glass is just does not do it for me. And I hate having to carry the tablets. Like they do have the light ones, but I liked having a trackpad. I just want it to be able to do all of it. Yeah. I want the touchscreen, the keyboard. 
it all there and to be light and to be able to travel with it. So now I have, don't use my tablet does it, at all. Does it make but a you difference? you have a touchscreen on your Apple, though. You don't have a touchscreen on your Apple. I know. That's why I'm, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting that's for what, it. Help we were so Apple. in sync today, and then you had to go and ruin it. Apple's them. never going to put a touchscreen on Sorry. There. They don't want to. Uh, they're already losing uh, market share to the <laughs> iPad. Sorry. It feels like it, there's more greenery than there used to be here. Am I wrong? We've you lost know, like Leo. Liz Where's Leo? The Daily Show. Jurassic Park. L Leo <laughs> LaForest. <laughs> Do you feel Leo better now, Oscar. Owen? Are you feeling a little more at home in the Grove? You, you, do you know why I feel better? Because why? the joy of my heart every time Georgia giggles when they put you on screen. Of course I feel better. She, she's my Chewbacca mom for right now, and I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Wait a minute. She's this week, this week in Wiccan. I'm not able to find Leo. Actually, speaking of the uh, Chewbacca mom, don't you have uh, one of those masks, Clayton? Did you get it? What? Did you what? Ah! 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 Oh, my God. That's terrifying. Can you laugh maniacally for us? <laughs> oh, it hurts. It's a little too tight. I love it. I love it. Can, can, can you wear the mask and go drive around? You can't. With by the way, we a, tried a DWB so experience. We desperately tried to get those. <laughs> See, listen to her laugh. It's amusing. I was drinking. <laughs> she's, like the, drinking. she's like the Chewbacca mom. For people li no, was, listening I was at home right now, like driving in their car, at the same time. Leo just removed his shirt. Well, I don't think that really explains the the whole. Well, the, the, Le Leo has removed his shirt. The totality of the experience, frankly. He, he is. He he looks like um. He looks like a um. <laughs> what I the the hair shampoo. What is it with the? <laughs> <laughs> it begins with the N. Yes. Naturally, like uh, weird nature's. Uh, taking a photo. Yeah. I gotta remember this moment. There we go. What is that? What is that hair shampoo? Where the girl puts it on and she turns into a jungle and she's having like the time of her life. Oh, oh yeah. What is that? I know what you're talking about. That's new. Nature's. Oh, oh my God. Herbal essence. Herbal, e herbal essence. essence. Herbal that essence. Like, Leo Laporte looks like he's in an herbal essence commercial. <laughs> And he is waiting for the shower scene to start. He is Irish surrounded spring. by flowers and trees and foliage and a microphone. He I is agree. a silver fox in the woods. Dude, right now. He is a I silver fox. Know, I want to know what people that just tune in at this point <laughs> do. They're going to be like, I feel show. that I have now, um, I'm channeling Johnny Ive, and I really want to have kind of a, a twit glade, a twit forest. And by the way, you're laughing, but the entire studio audience is also disrobed. <laughs> <laughs> now who's now who's running a foliage cult? They show up every Sunday. They got naked with you. You got plants all around. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the new Twit cult. This there is the new go. Twit. It's the new Twit, twit cult. <laughs> so we're gonna uh, take a break. Is this a, is this a Snapchat? <laughs> I, I, I'm living in Snapchat. I, I feel like I'm living. Now I feel Snapchat. like I'm out of. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. I just. I just need Clayton to wear the mask and ride around the hood with me and see if we get a DWB show going on. <laughs> two, two brothers in the hood. Two brothers in the hood. And by the way, that is uh, both better and worse with video. So if you're listening, <laughs> this might be one you want to download and watch, or maybe not. Actually, come to think of it, let's talk about Mars. Elon Musk has taken us there. I wasn't here for this episode, but Becky Worley, Christina Warren. Owen J.J. Stone and Jason Heiner were. Uh, Elon Musk. Uh, he, has, he has a plan for our future. <laughs> Colonizing Mars at the International Astronautical... Yes, at the International Astronautical Conference in Guadalajara, Mexico. He gave a talk. It was called Making Humans a Multiplanetary Species. And uh, this is his idea for getting to Mars. Uh, SpaceX... I'm going to break down the specifics because that's basically what Elon did. It was incredible. And, you know, whenever he does this, when he gets into the nitty gritty of talking about his absolutely insane plans, it sort of boggles my mind at how bored he sounds talking about these amazing ideas <laughs> and seemingly impossible to execute uh, concepts. So I will, I will try not to go at it with the same sense of, of like, oh, yes, when we go to Mars, boredom. But let me just try and break this down for you. So uh, SpaceX would use reusable BFRs. These are big 
bleep rockets, uh, along hmm. with the BFS, big bleep spaceship, uh, Raptor rockets capable of 680,000 pounds of thrust. The ship would carry 100 tons of cargo. Uh, once in orbit, it would re be refueled. Uh, then it takes off from Mars. Um, it, he really got down to the nitty gritty in terms of cost. So right now he says it would cost about $10 billion per person to send someone to Mars. Uh, his goal is to scale this down, you know, just make it the economies of scale work for him, targeting $200,000 per person, eventually $100,000. Uh, he's all about reusable parts. Trips take 100 people at a time. The spaceship would have movie rooms, cafeterias, entertainment options. He says they would be. It would be a really fun place. That's his quote. A fun place. Uh, yeah, I don't know how long you'd have to be on that ship. That's sort of um, terrifying. Uh, he's targeting 2022 for these flights. Public and private organizations are going to help fund the missions, and a million humans could live on Mars by the 2060s. Uh, are you guys in? You going? Can I break? Can I break in on this report real quick, just for two seconds? Whoa! Uh, you've been hijacked. This, this, this is my buddy Tony. Say hi to people, Tony. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> uh, Tony, what's your college degree? I have a bachelor's degree in marine science with a concentration in uh, marine biology. What's your current job right now? Uh, jet mechanic. For what? For who? Uh, the United States Air Force. So basically, Tony's a really smart guy. Just trying to do this as quick as possible. Some reference. Um, Tony, are we going to Mars? No, not <laughs> how long would it take us to get to Mars? Tony's Tony? face expresses skepticism for those of you listening. How, how, how long? How long, Tony? Just give me an estimated time period, like a year. I don't. I'm not. I, a, long, a long time. Fifty thousand, twenty thousand. No, like a long time. Like a hundred thousand. More, more than ten years. More than ten? Yeah. Okay. That's all I need. That's all I need. Good. So <laughs> the big brain sitting next to you, Odakta, yeah, yeah. says this is total malarkey. We're not going to Mars. <laughs> We're not going to Mars. First of all, so, I'm gonna let you guys talk, but let me just say this. I want. I love Elon Musk. I love the sun. I love the solar. I love Hyperloop. I love most of the things he talks about. But for peace sake, could you just use that big brain and all this money you want to put into a desert rock planet that doesn't sustain life and fix the planet we got right now? Can we figure out a way to stop killing all these bees in the ocean so we can have a planet we got right here for some sustainability? Can we get $10 billion to just clean up the homeless and give them a job or something instead of per person to put them on a planet that can't sustain life? Can we do that? Elon, I love you so much, and I hate the way you manipulate the stock market and my heart. But shut up about Mars and your little <laughs> ship that crashes half the time that ain't gonna be able to land on no. Just stop it. We ain't going to Mars. We ain't going to Mars. We ain't going to Mars. Now go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> oh, That's God, it for Twit. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> How do you I just can't. That? I just lo I loved and I loved the man so much. Like he, he his, oh. like just fi give me the sun, Elon. Fix this Earth we got, cause you and uh, broke people can't get to Mars. You know, and so you gonna send these rich? Okay, Jason Calacanis is gonna be the first person to Mars. He ain't no engineer. <laughs> he ain't no mechanic. He can't fix nothing. What's he gonna do? Complain about the weather? Like <laughs> we need we need grunt workers to get to. Like, it's not gonna happen, bro. Uh. Uh. That's a perfect segue to the something I learned last week. So the same day that Elon announced this, um, we when I was at this event, uh, Idea Festival uh, last week, which is an innovation event, but it's like Ted. You know, Ted cost you like ten, five, ten thousand dollars, right? This this event cost you like a hundred, two hundred bucks. Um, but it's the same kind of people, right? Uh, talking about big ideas. So the day that Elon was talking his big ideas about Mars. There was um, somebody there, uh, one of the candidates for Mars One. So there's this nonprofit organization called Mars One. Um, they uh, they they do a lot of um, work with. It's an international based organization. Um, they do a lot of work with NASA. But uh, there's a Mars One candidate. They they've got this down to a hundred candidates. Uh, it's this MIT systems analyst named Yari Golden um, Castiano. And so she was at Idea Festival talking about the fact, and I had no idea about this. I hadn't heard of this, um, but it was ironically early. It was that morning, and then Elon made his his uh, presentation that afternoon. So I knew a lot about more about Mars by uh, the time he did it. Um, so Mars One is this group that they're basically sending scientists, people who can go and study it, because what they found is that you know we've sent these all of the it's not space tourism it's um it, it's they're, they're trying to get some scientists to go up there and do the same thing and ultimately elon's worried about which is 
if we trash this planet, you know, what are we going to do? And so we've sort of reached the limits, what Mars One, you know, posits is that we've reached the limits of what we can do with robots, right? We actually have to send some people there. But sending them and getting them back is the hard thing. So they want to take a group of uh, 24 people, um, interdisciplinary, send them to Mars, create this colony um, uh, with these 24 people, these scientists. And so because of that, they're working on, so one of the things that Yari is working on that she talked about, we have a video um, of this on Tech Republic. Uh, we got an interview with her afterward. Um, she's working on this laser-based communication so that, because right now it takes anywhere from several minutes to um, almost an hour to get a communication from Mars to Earth. Um, and so this laser-based satellite communication, you know, basically super high-speed networking, um, will send it a lot faster. But the idea is the stuff, and she's working on this um, at MIT, uh, and with the idea of uh, hoping that she's going to be one of the candidates uh, on this. But if not, at least she can develop technology that's going to help. And, oh, by the way, this technology, to get it, your point, um, uh, Odak, to, you know, is that, uh, this technology could actually help us here on Earth, too. And so like a lot of the space technology, right, a lot of the stuff that went into the space program um, ended up, uh, yeah, it was okay, and it did interesting things for the space program. But, you know, the the record of the kind of advances, you know, that uh, they they gave to the tech industry is huge. And so that's the bigger benefit to a lot of this stuff. Uh, I think for, for Elon's case, you know, he's sort of uh, the showman. And so his is sort of the P.T. Barnum version of the Mars story. Right. But there are other people who are working on this as well. And, and it's important not to forget that. Their goal is they want to send someone to Mars by 2027, and they are working toward that. They just you know, narrowed down their 100 candidates. Um, t- next year um, in 2017, um, they're going to name the 24 candidates, and then they're you know working on working toward this, uh, you know, for over the next decade. Christina, you buying it? No, I mean, I think eventually, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think eventually, I think that because there are there is real science happening, and 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 there there's real you know uh, potential for space exploration. I think will we get there? Sure. I, I think not to discount Elon because I think that what he's doing is important just insofar that it gets people paying attention. It, 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 it It's exciting. But to Jason's point, I mean, he's very much a P.T. Barnum sort of guy. And I mean, I think making these proclamations like, you know, 2022, like that's so close. Like, come on now. Like, uh, l- like let's be real. Um, I also really appreciate, I guess it's sort of funny to me, you know, the way that he kind of phrases this. He's like, well, you know, you could die on this mission. So please pay me $500,000 to go on this mission <laughs> where you might die. And, and, oh, I'm not willing to go yet until I know that someone can take over my companies, you know, because because this is basically kind of a suicide mission. And so part of me is kind of I, I'm, I'm intrigued by, I think, what like space exploration could do. But I'm a little bit, I guess, bothered by even though I know that that fundamentally what some of the things that that uh, Elon Musk wants to do have like broader uh, technology and scientific, um, I guess, pursuits um, at their core. So much of it does seem to just be about, uh, you know, space tourism, which to me, it's kind of bothersome because the last thing that, that at least that I want in the way it's already kind of seeming like how it's being sold now is this is kind of being sold like, you know, the modern era of climbing Mount Everest, where it's just rich people who like pay $100,000 and go and climb the mountain because they can. And, and this is going to be a thing where people who are rich enough to go to Mars will go versus people who are actually looking at at discovering, you know, uh, other systems and and what what's habitable and what's not, and 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 discovering technologies that that might have, um, you know, pursuits other places. I I don't know. Uh, the whole thing is kind of like I'm also the, the his whole description of of Mars. All I can think about is the movie Wall-E and be like, yeah, okay, so we're just all gonna, you know, be on this other planet, you know, sitting, um, in a in stasis, not moving around, you know, just, just eating and watching TV. And that's the chat room be says the, uh, the best place on Mars is, it was a, the, the best place on Mars is worse than the worst place on Earth. Um, and yeah, Elon, <laughs> Elon described, you know, not only is the, is the trip there on this massive ship going to be fun because there'll be movie theaters, uh, <laughs> sure. according to Elon, because they have movie theaters on my plane to New York that I take every couple weeks. That's not so much fun. Um, but anyways, he also said it would be a lot of fun on Mars because the gravity's low. Um, so, but one thing that struck yeah. me, and I, I kind of feel like a dummy that I didn't, 
I'm sure everyone else has thought of this before, but it really struck me in his talk how, uh, you know, when we think about all of the space exploration and all of the technology innovations that came out of that when we did this through NASA and the, and the moonshot and how those spawned so many businesses and so much entrepreneurship and innovation as those engineers spun out of the, out of the government programs and started their own companies, but that now we're, it's privatized from the start here with Elon. Right. And so you've got, he was talking about on the ship, once it's launched and it's en route to Mars, that the solar arrays will deploy. And I thought, of course, solar, Elon, solar city. Then, mm. of course, that'll be putting itself, you know, it'll be storing energy into batteries, which will be a part of everything he's doing with Tesla. Then there's just all the... Uh, um, you know, the the engines that he's going to be innovating, that he's doing obviously now with SpaceX, but there's got to be a crossover with Hyperloop or with Tesla and realizing that all of this innovation and privatization of of innovation is going to be in one, it's a, it's a publicly traded company, but in one company's right. auspices and they will own all of that. And that kind of was, it just dawned on me, wow, all these pieces fit together. His brain is really big. Oh, it's, yeah, no, it's, his, his, go ahead. Talk about his I brain. was just going to say, no, you're right. I was going to say his brain is huge, but that, that, that is sort of problematic though, isn't it? Because I mean, you're pointing out like he's obviously seen all these puzzles and how it works for him. But I mean, but something like, I think that the travel to another planet should be about bigger than just one public company, one private well, enterprise. He is nice enough to say, yo, I know you guys are trying to make cars or electric. You don't know how to do it. Here's the patent. I'm just letting it go. I'm not going to fight you guys at court anymore. He seems like a decent enough guy when he's not being an insane sociopath. I'm just saying, you <laughs> told me that we could run the whole world on solar. We know that. But guess what? Human beings can't get together to go take some land out in North Dakota, build a solar farm, and give everybody free electricity. We can't do that. And guess what? Hyperloop? I haven't seen it. We got a test trap that's probably scrambling eggs and small chickens' brains. <laughs> somewhere out in the desert. So until you can give well, me free power. The companies, the companies in chaos. The Hyperloop stuff, uh, uh, that the drama there is fantastic. Because again, <laughs> we're just going to Mars and eating cookies and dough on the ice cream and watching the ship. You can't get Hyperloop together. We ain't even got our solar farms yet. Would you just pump the brakes, bro? Like, who, Are we living in domes? We're not going to Mars. We're not going to Mars. We're not going can to Mars. Can we get the Model 3 in mass production first? Right. Yeah, but, right. I'm just saying, just, yeah, uh, he, he just sounds like a little kid that's got Play-Doh and is telling me how he's going to make a store and he's going to have millions of dollars cut. And I'm like, but dog, it's Play-Doh. Trust me. I'm going to make this store out of Play-Doh and we're going to be rich, Dad. And I'm just like, okay, kid, okay. go in your room and imagine it. Like, I, have always, yes, I always thought of space as it makes me, um, I think I'm space phobic because it makes me feel like there's this dystopian future that's in totally. right around the corner that's going to come crashing down on my children. So this like dystopian space phobic, didn't want to even pay attention. Somehow Elon talking about it and making it sound so boring and so doable, mm -hmm. even in his <laughs> um, delusional mind, I will totally give you that, oh doctor. Um, but logical delusional. I, I, maybe that's not, maybe that's too contradictory to be real, but Jason, what do you think? Is, is there a logical insanity here? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the thing about Elon is Elon is, it, in the truest sense of the word, and it gets overused, he's a true visionary. Like, the guy, like, dreams in, um, you know, he sits around daydreaming and wishes he didn't have to eat. He's talked about the fact that how much he liked the idea of something like Soylent because then he could take all, you know, this, this like, whatever, 43 minutes a day that it takes to eat meals and, and get rid of that and put it in a more productive time, like dreaming about Mars, right, and, and solar power and all of these kinds of things. And so... I think that you know Elon sets these super aggressive goals. Um, his companies never get there, um, but on the way to trying to get there, they get to things faster than other companies, right? Um, Tesla's way far ahead in battery technology. Yeah. They're way far ahead in in um, electric vehicles. They're way far ahead in a lot of these things um, because he sets these like crazy, stupid, aggressive goals uh, that we're going to accomplish this um, massively hard thing by this time. And that's what leaders do, right? Leaders push, leaders um, reach, leaders, uh, you know, get you to get more out of you than you, you know, thought was possible. And so I agree with, I agree with everybody on the panel, like 2022, <laughs> Or, or yeah, it's not happening. Like it is <laughs> not happening. 
2027, this other Mars One group, maybe, maybe Elon falls somewhere in there. I, like I said, it sounds very P.T. Barnum to me. It sounds maybe 20 years off. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I can't remember, somebody said the fact about how passionate he was talking about this even compared to some of the other, I think it was you, Becky, um, even compared to some of the other stuff he does where, where he is reasonably passionate. I, I think this is the thing that gets him up in the morning. I think this like this whole totally. Mars thing. And, and I, I'll give you, Owen, the fact that there, there's some bigger problems I wish he would spend his time focusing on because, you know, the guy like does you, have some serious if, brain if power. If you're going to dream yeah. big, look me in my face and tell me, you know what? We have problems with the coral reefs. And if you don't know anything about the coral reefs, it impacts the fishing community. The fish community impacts the people on land and, you know, the food industry because chickens and all that, they eat fish meal, but you don't understand how much fish is in. And we get, hey, you know, Elon Musk, come out and tell me you're going to solve that problem in 10 years. And I'll strip butt naked and run through these streets. Not that anybody wants to see it. But I'd be so happy and proud, just like you told me, that we can take a small <laughs> patch of land and power the world. Like, I understand about vision. I got a lot of vision. I got a vision of a machine that I could sit in and just lose weight and not do anything. It just just like melts off the fat. I can envision it. It ain't gonna happen. It sounds like it's a cool thing. By 2027, I could be 150 pounds. It's just saying that he just thinks the fun stuff doesn't make it a vision. He sounds like a little kid sometimes when he gets all hyped up on this stuff and he moves mountains <laughs> with his words. If he told you he liked cookie dough, the stock market would triple within the next half hour after a tweet. The man's got too much power. Fix the planet first before you start going to a red desert with nothing on it. I'm not gonna yell about it anymore. It just makes me really upset. That you this know what he never talks about? I think it's is connected. Sorry, it is. Ahead, it's all interconnected. And what's interesting about that, Odakta, is that he never talks about political will or the, the, the moral will to do some of these things. He's only dealing with what he has under his control. And what's yeah. incredible is how much control he actually has. Yeah, uh, he, it's growing. He's it's only going to keep growing, too. Yeah. He's, he's ruining his kingdom with an iron fist. That's for sure. We have had so many great people on this show. And I want to thank Becky Worley for uh, filling in for me uh, when I was on vacation. One of the nice things about, uh, about the, the friends and family that Twit has gathered around it is that when I take vacation, I know we're going to have a great fill-in. And uh, Becky is one of our absolute favorites. She'll be back, I promise you. Our show today, we're going we're gonna to have some fun uh, with, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to give it all away, but some more stuff coming up in just a second. But first, a word from our sponsor, uh, on New Year's Day, you're probably not planning on doing much cooking. You might be planning on relaxing. But when it's time to uh, get back in the kitchen, you'll be very glad to see that Blue Apron box sitting there waiting for you. Problem with cooking, look, I love to cook, and I like to make healthy, nutritious, delicious meals for my family. But, you know, at the end of a long work day, you, you, the last thing you probably want to do is like, plan a meal, go shopping, buy the ingredients, go home, cook them, and serve it. Blue Apron takes half of that work out and makes the rest of it lots of fun. See, what you do is you go to blueapron.com, you look at their menu plan for the week, you pick some meals, then they come to you in a refrigerated box, fresh, never frozen, even the meat and fish, with a recipe card, exactly the ingredients you need to make that recipe, no more, no less. They have plans for couples. In fact, if you're single, it's great too because you make a dinner and you got a lunch the next day. Uh, they also have a plan for families, and those have more kid-friendly ingredients. But in every case, it's something delicious, something you will be amazed you made. You'll be so proud serving it. Your kids, your lovers, your friends will go, wow, you can really cook. And you'll just go, yeah. You don't have to say it's Blue Apron. You just go, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm getting better. Blue Apron, look at the menu. Steak and green peppercorn sauce with kale and roasted potato. I hate doing these. My mouth starts watering. Cod and papillote. With frica, I don't know what that is, and spinach. That's another thing I like about Blue Apron. I learn new ingredients all the time. And then I can go in the store and say, yeah, I need some of that frica there. That was good last time. I don't know what it is even now. I haven't used it yet. I'll use it this week. Potato and artichoke quiche with romaine and orange salad. Blue Apron, my friends. I'm going to uh, trust me, you're going to love it, but I'm going to get you your first three meals free. That way you can really appreciate it. Go to blueapron.com slash twit. First three meals free, free shipping, and... Uh, I'm sorry, they don't deliver to, con to uh, Hawaii or Alaska. It's 99% uh, of the continental United States, and that's because they want it to come fresh, right? Uh, so, but just check it out. I'm sure it's available in your area. The best ingredients, fresh, delicious from 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. And by the way, 
it costs less than if you did it yourself. Less work and less money. A grocery store would be about 60% more for the same food. And, blue, and the reason is Blue Apron doesn't have a, a, a store, doesn't have a warehouse, doesn't have brick and mortar. They don't have to worry about waste or spoilage. So they really can save you money. And what a meal. I think of it as cooking up some love for my family. You will too. BlueApron.com slash twit. Blue Apron is a better way to cook. And we thank them so much for their support all year long of this week in tech. Oh, it just kept getting worse this year for Yahoo. <laughs> worse and worse and worse. Uh, Stephen Levy, Georgia Dow, and Steve Kovac joined me uh, just a couple of weeks ago to talk about the latest bit of bad news for Marissa Meyer and company. Watch. It's just one thing after another with Yahoo, isn't it? Um, now they say that one, and I think it's a story just because of the number, one billion user accounts have been breached. This happened a few years ago. Uh, remember that, uh, of course, uh, earlier Yahoo had revealed that half a billion accounts have been breached in a separate hack. At this point, you got to wonder, is Verizon going to go through with the deal? What happens to Yahoo next? We had um, uh, AOL CEO Tim Armstrong, who's kind of helping spearhead that deal at our conference uh week and a half ago now and w this was before the disclosure of the hack and we asked him uh my colleague asked him point blank like you know what get put a number on this what's the percentage chance that this happens and he wouldn't do that but he's like i'm cautiously optimistic that it, the deal is going to go through a week later this happens so Oi. uh Oi. so it, it's either going to be a discount uh, you got to think they're they well, still they asked for Yahoo a billion off they, they already yeah. Verizon already asked for a billion off for the first hack and actually, exactly. what's really important is uh, what did Marissa Meyer know and when did she know it? What Did she hide this material information from uh, Verizon and other suitors when they were selling the company? And there's some evidence that she did on the 2014 hack. This billion account hack happened a year earlier. So it would, stre it would stretch credulity to think that Marissa Meyer did not know about this billion account hack from 2013. I'm just shocked that that many people still use Yahoo. <laughs> I know. That was the other thing. A billion people, really? Names, <laughs> email addresses, really? telephone numbers, really? dates of birth, passwords. <laughs> the uh, company says it thinks it's distinct from the 2014 hack. And it it, it, it says, oh, and the hackers aren't in our network anymore. So they say. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Uh -huh. What do you think? If Verizon uh, pulls out... Maybe they'll just ask for another billion off. What happens? Yeah, th there's still a lot of value in Yahoo, right? Yeah. Because of uh, Alibaba, J Yahoo Japan, and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's well, you don't get the Alibaba kind of stake with the okay, with the, Alibaba. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but you know, there is a lot of value still tied up in there, and and they do have a massive user base. Um, so I mean, it's and especially for what AOL <laughs> wants to do with it, well, it we makes do, sense. We do know they have a massive user base, but. <laughs> How much, no, but people, how much longer? Yahoo.com, that's how a lot of people get their I news. Know. You want to talk about visiting a home page for getting your news. True. Yahoo is my massive. Yahoo. I use my Yahoo yeah. for years as my home page. I'm happy mm -hmm. to say I've grown out of it, but um, it was my home page. This is the big uh, news of the weekend, at least. Uh, you can pull up my screen here. Brace yourselves. Uh, if there's kids in the room, you want to get them out. But here is Robert Scoble <laughs> wearing the new See, Snapchat <laughs> spectacles. Don't if you, you love don't the know internet? about Snapchat? Yeah, you can turn, take there's, it off the there's screen. There's multiples oh, of, thank these, you. of this photo, <laughs> oh, thank by you. the way. I love the can... fact that the producers here are just so quick to get something off the screen. That's just absolutely abhorrent. Okay. <laughs> um, here we go. I think we just had to put the explicit on the uh, iTunes for this show. <laughs> right. nice. um, so uh, let's watch the video here, and I think we can talk over it. But... Um, uh, as people know, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, app, uh, Snapchat rather, bought a promising company that was making video sunglasses. Yeah. And they, uh, it was a, a Indiegogo and a Kickstarter. It was one of these like kludgy hardware projects that you figured, eh, they're never going to deliver it. I believe they did deliver their product. Um, it was never shipped it. They never it. shipped it because no. on one of the, I went to one of the pages like and they I said they pictures. got it. Um, I have pictures I of it. Snap. Anyway, I have pictures of the founder here. Let me yeah. see. 
Anyway, and these were the pictures of the prototypes. I don't know. Uh, is there a camera here that? Can there, there's grab? a camera looking at you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look at look at directly your face. Everything. Yeah. So there's the founder wearing them, and yeah. the way these this work. This is two years ago. This is two years ago. Yeah. The way these product the product works is, um, if you press a button on the corner, yeah. it lights up an LED circle for 10 seconds, records whatever you see, and posts it automatically to your Snapchat. You never have to take your phone out of your pocket. You never have to authenticate or whatever it is. And critically, and I think that this is the big difference, Google Glass resulted in many people getting punched in the face, beat up, or many arguments and fights started nah, because- there was three no, there were or plenty. four. More okay, than... whatever. There were three or four that were well documented. One by a woman who I think was trying- Sarah, Sarah Slocum. The, the, oh. the sense I got was she was trying to provoke people with them. Yeah. Mm. She mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest. She was provoking That's how people we are, right? We no. Like no, that's the deranged. No, that was deranged. She no, was literally just walking up to people We're disruptors. In a bar. We're wearing weird things on our face. You know, and I don't think you're a push society. Yeah. Right? Go ahead. Right. She, she was trying to pick fights. I remember that. She was yeah. picking fights with me. She was picking fights with you. She was. No, just, she would walk up to you and be like, I'm recording you right now. What did I And you just feel like, you felt like you were being insulted by paparazzi. And then she would do it in a bar in San Francisco, which by the way, I don't think you want to go into a bar in San Francisco or anywhere and then, especially a dive bar, and then go up to somebody who's half drunk and say, can I record you? Or not even ask, just start yeah. recording them. But yeah. spectacles, they're totally different, at least yes, in my opinion. They're like, the price is completely different. 130. Yeah. The, like, which is just a- Versus 1300. Which is, yeah. which is a totally reasonable also, price for normal sunglasses. Times have changed. That too. Uh, we have Snapchat now. And Snapchat is a daily video show about your life. It's split up into little uh, segments. Uh, we might call them in TV land shots, right? We're, right now, somebody is choosing who to focus the cameras on. Yes. That's a shot. And probably we're on, Snapchat we're on air for week. five <laughs> seconds or ten seconds, right, while we're talking. And in, in Snapchat, that's what you're doing. You're capturing videos in a small segment, and yeah. it builds a, a narrative about your day. And you can actually grab the day and store it to your phone or share it out on other places like Facebook or YouTube, right? So uh, they solve the problem of you want to punch the person in the face yeah. because they're recording you covertly because you're going to press them. However... <clears throat> It is inevitable, Brian, that these will result in people putting up no snap glasses in this bar, in this club, at this concert, correct? So it is. I mean, you Will look there be at, a backlash? How big? Yeah, there was that woman who uh, posted something on Snapchat from her gym, right? There was the, oh, yeah, the, uh, the yeah. person that was older, a little heavier, standing over a tub, I uh, think, and she's like, I can't unsee this, then you have to see That's it against too. The law, she meant the to see it, send it to a friend. Yep. And she sent it oh. to her followers instead. Ooh. Taking People, the picture the, is illegal. Right. Did that. Snapping a picture in a locker room right. is illegal. Completely illegal, right? Completely. I didn't so, realize that was actually a law. I just yeah, thought that was a law in, that, that, in California, it's a law. Right. In that, that, that's also why the cameras on your phones make a noise. They don't have to make a noise, but they right. make a noise to alert people when you're in the gym club, you know, ah, shower, right? Which is so taking pictures like of light on Right. So, so, so I think they're doing this the right way. These are crazy. You can't miss them. They're not a Google Glass. It's also used to uh, open web browsers that only you can see and like all this other junk that that was right. supposed These to These are do, single right? function. Single function. I'm here to do this crazy thing. And you, you really can't hide them in a, a shower somewhere, right? Mo right. So. Most people don't understand why Google Glass uh, caused these fights. It really doesn't have anything to do about the camera. Because I was in uh, the Sahara tent at Coachella, and everybody's recording yes. on their phones. Well, you but know. But there was two, two guys in front of me. One talked to the other and said, I need to get away from the Google Glass people. I wasn't wearing it because yeah. I didn't wear it then. There was two people behind me who had Google Glass on. So I grabbed these two guys and said, what makes you nervous about this? You're in a place where everybody's recording. You're on so camera, it's not for about sure. the camera. Mm -hmm. And they said, it just makes me feel bad. Yes. Two reasons I pulled out of them. One, there's a screen be between them that they can't see and they can't renegotiate the social contract that we have with each other. If you start playing with Facebook right now in the middle of the show, I'd, I'd slap yeah. your hand. Why are you doing that where, when there's something more important to pay sure. attention to? And the second thing is, they um, felt that the person who had them on had information about them that they didn't have about the people that had them on. So they had an advantage, an information mm. advantage. And I'll tell you why I don't like it. Because I saw a Google executive get on the dance floor and all the girls left the dance floor. 
And I thought that was the reason. Yeah. Like, I run at the pub. I was like, we're just sitting here dancing with like 10 girls. And you literally, a Google exec well, comes about. He's like, hey. But they're not, they everybody not, runs. They were not that fashionable. The spectacles, if you actually look at the fashion Well, look at these. Now. Pull this one up. I mean, this is Evan Spiegel, who's dating a supermodel. I don't know who it is. Oh, she's, I think they're married or engaged. They're, they're or engaged. I mean, and look, this. I mean, he's from LA. He's a hip dude. And look at the side. No. He's got the side thing here. I mean, it looks well, good. So, so this what? style is in right now for like teenagers, like 13 sure. to 18. So it's part of it. So, you know, I want to do one prediction with the group. Okay, here we go. Uh, prediction or sales? long bet? We, we prediction or bet. long bet? Let's do a bet on okay, sales. Okay, here we go. Um, sales. You pick the time frame. Sales, com total, uh, let's see, 2017 sales. Not 20, when do they come out? Uh, well, 20, by the end of the year. By the end of the year. So 2017 was the first full year? No, no, start with the begin when they come out till the end of 2017. All right, well, no, no, no. Let's, let, let, let's give a mulligan on the first X. Let's just say 2018. Okay. 2018 total sales. Everybody write it down or type it on your computer. <laughs> uh, or actually, no, somebody can set the line. That's the better way to do it. We'll set the line and then make a bet. Who wants to set the line? Total what does that mean? Sold. To explain set the line over, is over under. under. We're going to do right. over under. So if you pick 10 million, uh, I can pick over or line. under. So you set the line. Every teenager is okay. going to have them. Every teenager, okay. 320 um, million Americans. Well, 70, I, I, 80 I'm million of them are under the age of 18. $30, they have to. Yeah. Mm. Let's say 20% of teenagers are going to have them in the first year. That's 14 million. Whatever number you no. come up with, I'm already saying under. I'm going to say 3.5, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, you have no clue. <laughs> all right, here we go. It's going to make a good bet. Like, and and this, again, is, all right. this is so funny because like a minute ago, you're like, I'm going to take half my ego. I'm going to park half over here. And now you're telling me, all right. Right, the chat is giving I, I've a whole been bunch meeting of with groups of Got teenagers to study this. Okay. All right. And every single teenager says they want one. Of course. So, uh, and, and it's when bucks, I go to Coachella, when Thomas Hawk right. and I went to Coachella and shot uh, people with big cameras, the millennials came up and danced for us. Mm -hmm. They want their picture taken. What is this Snapchat era? It's a selfie era. It's a oh, look at me era. Okay. This is going to be very, very popular. Okay, so the number, give us a number. Uh, I'd say. We're, by the way, we're going to bet for we're going to bet for months. a pair of the glasses, whatever the highest end pair is from Snapchat. We'll bet for glasses in the first eighteen months, basically. Um, you're no, 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 2018. 2018 yeah, total calendar year twenty eighteen. Uh, calendar year twenty eighteen. So wait, so it's just sales in there or total from before? Total sales in twenty eighteen only, not counting oh. the first year, because the first year could be like uh, who knows. How many GoPros sell a year, a year? That's a good question. It's going to be millions. That's the over under. Uh, millions, yeah. Will it beat GoPro? That's the over under because that's, that's the real well, one. That's will, the real company this disrupts because honestly, the technology honestly, I, on this I, is so I, okay. amazing. I, I, if you're saying if it's GoPro, yeah. I, I guarantee it. it sells more than GoPro. Right. In 2018, 100. percent As a matter of fact, yeah. I will. I will bet. I'll take will, that bet too. Okay. I'll Ooh. say it's. I, I say it's double. Double GoPro sales in 2018. Of go of traditional GoPro cameras. If GoPro comes out with one of these, I can't say that because it. Let's look at GoPro anyway. For sure, it'll outsell GoPro. What do you think, Brian? How, where would you set the line and the number will, that will be sold in 2018? I give up. He told me I was wrong. What do you think? Was, Is it uh, going to be? No, you know. So I, I totally get the kids using them. I actually like this angle where if I was thinking about getting a GoPro, which could cost hundreds of dollars or more, right? Yeah. I'm going to get these instead. For but sure. It's all, but it's only eight or ten seconds. It's not the whole three hours of my you know mountain climb, right? So, GoPro so, sold 1.6 billion in 2015. Billion? What? 1.6 billion, billion dollars. 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 Sales, Sales billion revenue. Right. Revenue. 1.6 billion. Revenue. So if you divide that by 400 dollars average, you're talking about whatever 40 million of them or something like that. All right. That's in 2015. So and they're going to sell probably more. Than I don't this know year. how much they cost. Uh, or four million of them actually. It'd be four million. Four million times 400. Yeah. Yeah, 4 million times 400. Um, I would say 2018 sales, I'll set the line at 6 million units. Slightly under. Uh, under or over in 2018? I think it's way over that. Okay, he thinks way it's over. way over that. He's Slightly got me convinced. under? What do you say? I'll, I'll take it over. You take the over? Take okay, over great. Six. I'm going to take the under. So we have two unders, two overs. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll bet. I hope I'm wrong. Please send me glasses. Oh, no, even better. We'll bet. We'll bet whatever the yeah. most expensive hamburger in San Francisco is. Can and Hard Hardaway expensive. says kids. If there's like a, there's going to be a $120 truffle hamburger. We'll find it. Hard Hardaway says kids will be over it in 2018. No. No. Well, no. Here, okay, so here's the feature that's missing from this that I thought, I had just written about it last week because I had heard this was coming. The, pick, the piece that's missing is it's not a DVR. And what this really should be is it should uh. always be recording. 
Yeah. I know this will get people punched in the face, but right. I the, really where this is going, and when I think this will probably happen by 2020, and I would fund a startup to do this because it's inevitable anyway, so I'm not going to make a judgment call on it. But if it's a DVR, and at any point in time I can press it and go back on the last hour, find that clip, right, and boom. So I don't have to press it. I say, wow, that was a funny moment. Now I'm pressing it. No, this is like my, my wife says this all the time. If we could just go back five seconds, that thing you said, you say yeah. you didn't say. Yeah. yeah. And like, this is like divorce product, not happening. No. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't say that. You said yeah, it. I know. Yeah, exactly. I never wait, said wait, that. Wait, go back. My right. wife is going to wear yeah. it. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to wear it. Like like okay, take your glasses off. Snapchat, Nobody's marrying you, Ben. Hey, I'm not going to wear it while I'm on a date. But here, here's the other thing. I think you're going to see a big load on 2017. And it's gonna be less, a little bit less in 2018 because it'll be, it's a two every other year kind of product. The, the thing we're all missing is there's some real technology in this product. There's two lenses. There's a reason for that. Because with two lenses, you can sure. do a computer on the diff and you can Def. build a point cloud, a sure. volumetric point sure. cloud. So I can capture you in three dimensions for VR and AR. Mm -hmm. And the algorithms that they're developing uh, for AR, putting things on your face, are getting really advanced for 2D. Wait until they do it in 3D. It's fairly clear that this is a step, a very pragmatic step towards augmented reality, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think yeah. we all agree on that. Screens if they put are just too expensive. The screens are very expensive. So if people get addicted to this, then I believe the second feature that's missing that would be pretty neat after the Life DVR, I'll call it, the Life DVR, is um, over people's head, putting their last snap, if your friends, who your friends in common are. In other words, when you walk through the world or you go to a party, you don't know who you know. Yeah. And you don't know who you've met before and you may not remember who their wife or their husband is or their kids' names are or who they dated in your social circle. You're going to actually have all that information floating on top of people's heads. Yeah. And that would really, really, really benefit uh, Snapchat. So they can do a lot more than Boca. People in the chat room are, are asking, what does this mean that you can do? If you have depth information, you can turn this entire world into Minecraft, for instance. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, Ben is a Minecraft character over there. And the whole world is bricks, right? Yeah. And that helps me make better content. Most people suck at content. Most people just know how to do a selfie or a little picture at Yosemite or something. They don't know how to frame the shot. They don't know how to blur the background. They don't know how to tell depth. a story. I read a yeah. lot of Snapchats and look at a lot of Snapchats and look at a lot of people's behavior on Twitter and Facebook to understand them. Most people suck at content. And this augmented reality stuff that they're doing on the face helps you tell a better story mm -hmm. about yourself. It makes you more interesting. It's funny to look at the feed and see Ben Parr wearing drag, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the filters you ben can choose. Wearing <laughs> drag again. Right. All right. By the way, by the way, I ended up getting those Snapchat spectacles. And you know what? They're actually pretty cool. They, they, I actually really like them. I've been snapping. And the funny thing is I have two, two kids, as you know, 24 and 22, Henry and Abby. And I, 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 uh, I told Abby, she's the 24-year-old, hey, I just got the Snapchat spectacles. She said, what are those? I said, Snapchat. She said, oh, yeah, I'm too old for that. 24. And then my son, Henry, I thought, well, I know he snaps. And I said, did you see that? Look at this. Look at this. Your dad's not such an old man after all. I said, what's that, dad? Spectacles. He had no idea. <sighs> the last, uh, if you're a parent, you know this. The last person you'll ever impress is your own kids. Never. Uh, in a bit, we're going to uh, say farewell to our old studios. Oh, but first, I want to thank, I think, the one of the biggest blessings moving to our new East Side studio is our internet here. Do you know we have 10 gigabit symmetric internet access in this studio? So fast that I can't even use it on most of my computers because the best they can do is one gigabit. It's, and it's from the best internet service provider in the country. And I say that with absolute confidence, SonicNet. I've been a SonicNet customer for more than a decade. I've known Dane Jasper, the founder, for longer than that even. I've interviewed him many times. He's, I consider him a friend. And uh, when we said we're moving, Jane said, well, you really ought to have the best internet. As it just so happens, you're in a Sonic neighborhood. Man, if you're in a Sonic neighborhood, get Sonic. Sonic is an EFF five-star rated ISP. They protect their users. They don't have bandwidth caps. They fight 
any attempt by the government or anybody else to get your private information. They're the good guys. And you will love the price of what you can get. Now, I know it's not everywhere, but Sonic, I think this is important because Sonic is showing you can do this, set a standard for Internet access so that others around the country can see it and appreciate it and do it. So even if you can't get Sonic, and I'm sorry if you can't, uh, you should be thrilled that they're around. Here's, here's what you get. I almost, I'm embarrassed even to tell you this because just, it's just going to make you unhappy. Uh, <laughs> Sonic's mission to bring Internet freedom to all with unlimited, uncapped Internet, residential or business fiber to the premise, not to the curb, but into the premise, gigabit connectivity. Now, it's for San Francisco, California, the North Bay Area of California, the East Bay Area, but they are expanding. So go to Sonic. Dot com, S-O-N-I-C dot com slash twit and check, see if it's available. Because here's what you get. 15, well, this is one account, 15 email accounts, a gigabyte of personal storage, personal web hosting with a new domain. You get fax line service. You get a home phone connection. This is all at one price. There's no add-ons to this. Ho home phone connection with unlimited local and long distance calling. And by the way, you can port your number. So you, if you have an existing number, you can bring it right over to Sonic. G download speeds of up to 1,000 megabits per second, a gigabit. And man, you have not lived until you have a gigabit. <laughs> With no caps. No caps. You ready? You want to know how much? How much would you pay? $40 a month. $40 a month. And... And, and then with that, for absolutely free, you get their stand up, their stand for privacy, for friendly and local customer support, uncapped bandwidth. I love Sonic. I think you probably figured that out by now. And we thank them so much. They are providing us with our internet. This is how we get to you through Sonic's 10 gigabit fiber connection to the outside world. Join the internet revolution. Visit sonic.com slash twit and receive your first month of Sonic internet and phone service free. Plus, bundle it with Dish and you'll save $120 on your Sonic bill. Then you get it all. Visit sonic.com slash twit. Thank you, Dane, the great team at Sonic. Uh, if, if you enjoy twit, you can thank Sonic. And uh, even if you don't enjoy twit, <laughs> thank Sonic uh, for making it all possible. Uh, let's see here. Where did I end? Did I end with, uh, we did the Yahoo? We did the downfall of the Mac, the AirPod. Oh, the Snapchat. Now, I know where we are. I think, you know, it's, it was five years ago, uh, 2011, that we moved into the brick house at great expense. And thanks to all of you who bought bricks to help that with that expense, we spent a million and a quarter dollars to build the brick house studios. Little did we know that the landlord <laughs> would kick us out five years later so they could put a brew pub in there. Well, the good news for us is we found a new spot, the East Side Studios. We love it. Here's our farewell to the old and ringing in the new. This, I'm sad to say, is the last twit we'll be doing in this studio. I'm glad you all, this great studio audience, could be here for this. Uh, we will next week be doing the very first show. There's some question about that since apparently there's an electrical issue, but we, <laughs> we may be in the dark. But outdoor we'll be doing, show. yeah, it might be outdoors. Oh, yeah, we will be, be so doing. Awesome. Might be with a generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get a generator. <laughs> nice little hum in the background the entire I time. I will make it happen somehow. <laughs> we'll find a way to make that uh, studio uh, work next week. Uh, so do tune in early because we'll be uh, taking the trolley car uh, over to the new studio at about uh, I'd say about two thirty between two and two thirty Pacific, five five thirty Eastern, twenty one thirty UT. See, join us for Twit next week and every week. If you can't be here live, you can always get after the fact on demand. Audio or video from our website, twit.tv, or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Please subscribe. We want to make sure you don't miss an episode. Thank you for being here. And for the last time in the Twit Brickhouse, I say another Twit is in the can. Bye-bye. There is nothing wrong with your Twit. Do not attempt to close this browser. We are controlling the stream. We control the video. We control the audio. You are about
about to participate in a new online adventure. You are about to experience the sights and sounds of the new Twit Studio. Please stand by. Five, four, Whoa. three, <laughs> two, one. And the champagne popped a little bit early. <laughs> This is Twit. And we welcome you to the Twit East Side Studio, still in beautiful downtown Petaluma. Hello, everybody. Our brand new studio is online and on the air, and we are celebrating with champagne. Alex Lindsay, can I pour you a little glass? Uh, yes, please. We brought all in studio hosts today, all of our staff hosts. There is Jason Howell from Fantastic. TNT. Thank you so much. Yep, yep, yep. Father Robert Balasser. Are you allowed a little champagne once in a oh, while? If I drink from both hands at the same time. <laughs> Just for a good time. <laughs> Call Father Robert and also Megan Maroney. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to start this uh, new uh, episode in our life uh, with our hosts, the people who uh, come in every day and work so hard. Formerly at the Brick House Studios, now here in our new studios, and it's a little rough. Uh, if you're just uh, tuning in, I got to tell you, it's uh, you know the engineers were up all night. They've been up for several days, frankly, many of them, uh, wiring and moving stuff over because I I was mean, I was cruel. I said I don't want to miss any shows. I want to go as best we can, as we did the last time, from broadcasting at the Brick House to here at the East Side Studios. And you know what, to their credit, they made it made it happen. So a tip of the hat, John Slanina, our, uh, to Alex Gumpel, to Russell Tammany, uh, and, and uh, to our uh, engineering uh, director, uh, Bruce Chesham, to you, Patrick Delahanty, to all the people who work so hard uh, behind the scenes to make this uh, possible. Let's, uh, let's toast the new Brick House. Sorry, East Side Studios. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Leo. All right. So if you if you're watching, and I know most of you listen, so if you're listening, you probably don't notice any difference, right? It looks the same to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah nobody, you know, they're like, I don't know what they're talking. The dark about. red at the back of your eyelids are exactly the same. But for those of you watching on a video, there's a little bit of a difference. We brought the gear with us. We brought the wall with us. We brought the the little thing behind us. We have a new table. This table they promised me is impervious to any kind of abuse that we might give it. It's comp I find that to be optimistic. <laughs> Except gonna... that you have all of the audio controls for all of our there microphones at my feet, right underneath where you're sitting. Just what you wanted. Uh, Just probably be careful. not their permanent. Cool. It's a lot of power. Probably not their permanent, uh, no, I permanent place. <laughs> hey, I also should thank, if I want to go home tonight, my wife, Elisa Laporte, our CEO, <laughs> the person who really made this all happen, who uh, was the project director. And you should get some champagne. Too. <laughs> 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 Woo! Without Lisa, we couldn't pay the bills. We wouldn't have this beautiful studio. Uh, she found it for us. She managed the, the build out. And uh, thank you, Lisa, for doing such a great job. And thank you to everybody here in studio. We've got a huge studio audience today. Some familiar faces, some new faces. Welcome to all of you uh, to Petaluma. Um, what do you think? You like it? Yeah. We survived. No, I don't think we lost anybody in the process. Sort of. Hey, this has been a lot of fun, but I think we got a party to go to. I uh, I am really thrilled with how this worked. Thank you so much to our team. They stayed up all night wiring and, and getting this all working, and they did a fabulous job. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to uh, my team here at the table, the greatest Megan Maroney. It's uh, as it's such a thrill to be able to continue to work with you after all this time and. And keep making uh, great stuff. We'll see you on uh, tomorrow for uh, iOS Today and, of course, Monday through Friday for TNT. Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit. He's on loan from God, but uh, we're glad to have him. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. If God ever wants you back. I'm, I'm on a mission from God. <laughs> we're on a mission from God. Uh, this Week in Enterprise Tech, Know How. Am I missing anything? Uh, just the live events. And, and yeah. great job, by the way, at IDF last week. That was fun. Uh, at uh, DEF CON. Where are you going next? What's the next live? Are you going to IFA? We're going to Berlin. Twit will be at IFA covering three days of the show. That's exciting. Nice. When's that? How soon is that? That's, uh, uh, what, in a week and a half. Wow. And you're taking Brian Burnett? Brian Burnett and Colleen. Brian Burnett was going to be on this table. He's also one of our hosts, but he very kindly agreed to bow out uh, because this... Apparently, w when they designed the table, they said, Leo, what's th who's the, the most number of people you would ever want to have on this show? And I said, we would never want more than five people on this show. And, of course, the very first show we do here, I wanted to have six people. 
<laughs> and Sean said, you said five. <laughs> so, Brian, thank you. We love you, Brian. We'll get you on a, a twit real soon. Thanks also to Alex Lindsay. Appreciate the 360 degree. That's awesome. It's a That's wonderful cool. gift. Thank you. Yeah, we'll keep that on. <laughs> I hope people watch it. No now, problem. It's going to be on YouTube permanently, right? So people can go back and look at it. It's, it's right? Yeah. It's yeah. YouTube and, live. And then we'll also take uh, we'll take some of the footage. And we, I don't know if we'll do the whole show, but we'll, we'll do an example that's in 4K stereo. And, you know, right. that, that right. still takes a little time to put out. But people who are watching it were thrilled. They really got, it was fun for them to take a look around and see it. So we'll do some sort of three sixty something. Yeah, we're, we're still figuring it out. Like so, a lot of it is we just like to figure out, put it in in, in places and seeing what happens. Yeah, you know, like you know, it's really interesting. It, you know, yeah, so. yeah. And of course, my good friend Jason Howell, always a pleasure to have <laughs> you, host of TNT and all about Android. Thanks to all the people who came out today. It's been really great. Thanks to all of you at home who's put up with the disruption. I hope it hasn't been uh, too bad. We plan on uh, continuing all of our shows from our new East Side studios. You can come and watch us. Email tickets at twit.tv. Watch live 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC every Sunday afternoon. Or get your show on demand, audio and video of all of our shows available at our website, twit.tv, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe and make sure you get every single episode. I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. Another Twit. I'll say it one more time. Is in the can. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Incid incidentally, uh, just so you know, the uh, new studios are, the rent's half as much. The power bill is half as much. Uh, we get, we have all the set. We lost one set, which we never used anywhere, the Sky set. This set's the same. My, stu my office is actually better. And the staff is happier because in the old set, they used to have to be quiet. Now they could talk and be loud down the hall. So anyway, we're in the brick house now. And uh, thanks to everybody. The bricks, by the way, came with us from the old studio. And we still haven't figured out where we're going to put them, but I, I think we're going to put them on the wall outside. We still have an open studio, though. We invite you to come by and visit. You can visit your brick. You can visit the studio. Just email tickets at twit.tv. All right, let's uh, wrap things up now with Kurt Wagner of Recode, Jason Snell of Six Colors, and my old friend, we knew her as Callie Lewis, Luria Petrucci, uh, with a great discussion of live video. I'm really intrigued by this uh, Facebook Live thing. I think we're going to talk a lot about video today. Facebook launched, and again, I don't know if this is only on my app, so you guys can confirm this. Uh, my app has changed a lot. This is the Facebook app. And this is, you'll like this, Luria. Now, in addition to news feed and people, there's a new video button that if I yeah. touch that, it shows video. Facebook is all in. Well, look at that. Oh, You're right hey. there. <laughs> I, was doing, I was doing one earlier this morning. How about that? <laughs> Facebook is all in on video to the point where they're, they're surfacing it as an equal to the news feed. Yeah, well, Mark Zuckerberg came out recently and said, I mean, at, at the F8 conference, he was talking about how important live video is to them. And they are freaking killing it in the live streaming space. You know, Leo, you've been doing live streaming for years. You do it kind of on a more... I'm going to uh, buy a full page produced. ad in the New York Times that says, welcome, Facebook. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but with mobile live streaming, I mean, they're really doing a whole lot in that space. And so I, I, we wanted to make sure that we were kind of in that and killing it in that space as well. Um, so we actually, we figured out how to use a live stream HD 550 studio box. So that's my question, because I know live. how to do this because, uh, you know, it has a go live button right here and I can just uh -huh. go live from my phone. and. Yeah. That's actually interesting because that's also been around in this, but it was a little harder to find. If you wanted to post to Facebook, you'd have to tap what's on your mind and then scroll down and then you'd see the the go live. In fact, for a while, I didn't even think this was in uh, the Facebook for Android version, but now they've... That just was released like two days ago. Yeah, but now, and they've really, because of this video button. And so everybody has this video button now? You have it, Jason? No. No. Not on iOS yet. They're, they're rolling it out, I believe. I think they well, announced it a few few weeks ago, right, right before F8. So and then probably slow rollout. Tell me, Kirk, if you have this because on the bottom of my Facebook, this is new too. I have categories, so I have news feed, but I also have world and U.S. news, funny. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of subject matter, and I can even turn it on or off with this with the settings button. I'm thinking I must be in some sort of a beta test of this. Sorry, it's so bright. I should turn my screen brightness down. Um, I think you're. I think you're getting this, this 
not necessarily um, something that's totally, totally new. I know that people have written about that as, uh, okay. a few months ago. But at the same time, I don't have that. Yeah, uh, A lot of people I've seen have not had it. So I do think you're you, you're one of the lucky few. They somehow picked you. Well, I don't know if I feel to, so uh, lucky. test all of these <laughs> things. It's interesting, though, because what it really tells me, um, both this scroll bar at the bottom and the new video category at the top, is that Facebook wants to be a media company, not a social network. Right, Kurt? Is that... Is that fair to say? I think that they want to do a lot of stuff. And if you were at F8, you could see that uh, ultimately the, the one thing I will give Facebook is that they really stay true to that mission, which is about connecting people. And it sounds a little corny. It sounds a little cliche. But everything that they do, right, I mean, the fact that they're trying to uh, set up Wi-Fi enabled cities, um, they're going to test something in San Jose California around that. Um, the fact that they have internet beaming drones, you know, it's all about getting people onto the internet and therefore, you know, connecting them with, with the different apps that they have. I think the way that they keep you coming back is through the media and entertainment part of it, right? Because I'm only going to log on to Facebook if I'm exchanging a message or if I have a comment on something that I posted. But the reason I open the app every single day, even when I don't have those things happening, is because there's great videos and there's great stories and all these other things that I read. So I don't know if they would describe themselves as a media company, but I could, you know, they've married media and communication in a way that hardly, I don't think anyone else has really done. I think Snapchat's trying to do it, but, but that's about it. And I'll add on to that, Kurt. That's a very good, very good point. Um, but they, because of their ad platform and how prominent that is, and how many, how much money they make off of it, you know, that's a big deal for them. They have to keep that attention coming back over and over and over um, mm -hmm. in order to make sure that people continue to have effectiveness with those ads. Um, and of course, they're putting so much. Con, they're putting so much effort into people who use that. Like you almost can't necessarily be effective if you don't use it, which is kind of a negative. Um, right. But if you have high engagement, you can kind of get over that. So, you know, it's, I saw somebody in the chat room. I'm sorry, I missed your name um, a, a minute ago who said, you know, they're focusing on celebrities and they always start with celebrities. Then they always kind of roll it out to the masses. And Facebook Live is for everybody now. It's not just uh, yeah. for less celebrities. Well, I they're think, paying. They're paying. Though, but they are paying they some. In. They're paying right. celebrities yeah. and they're paying some some media partners too. So, you know, that's something that, it, as far as I know, Twitter and Periscope have never been willing to do. And uh, I think you know it. it it's gonna. You're gonna assume certain things. Okay, Facebook's now paying for this. Eventually, they're gonna want to to pull that back and uh, uh, figure out another way because you can't afford to pay people for content forever. But at the same time, I mean, look at you. You look at all the people who are broadcasting on Facebook Live in the last three months. I mean, it wasn't even a thing. It, it basically, we we didn't even talk about this at the turn of the year, January first. Mm -hmm. Now, every single publisher and every single media property around is is going live on a regular basis. So it's working. The problem is like, okay, now can they transition from, hey, we've been paying you all along to we want you to do this you know, because you want to do it and not because we're giving you money. And so they're going to have to figure out a way to monetize it in a way that, uh, that's, you know, keeps that incentive high. Facebook's not paying you, Kelly, right? This is a platform no. for you. But I wonder, do you worry about going all in as you have on Facebook? Because it's not, so. I mean, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a valid, your platform. Point. Right, exactly. You never want to like go all in on somebody else's platform. I well, just risky. That as a, it is risky. I mean, you 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 can if if you have a strategy behind you to get people on to your own platform, right? So, and that's the way we. So use you're it. you're you know, using it as is, a way to promote what you're doing elsewhere. Not fully. I, I mean, yes. So we have that strategy in place and we always drive traffic to our own properties. Um, you know, so from a business perspective, you have to think about that kind of thing. Um, from, you know, a content perspective, you don't get our content live unless you are there live on Facebook. We do Po we do release that content later. Well, it stays on website. Facebook, right? I mean, people can now exactly. see it. Uh, if you're in my feed, I missed the the first show, but I could see it because it's in my feed. Jason, would you? Right. You're a content creator as much as anybody. Would you consider creating a Facebook specific show live I on Facebook? I think you have to consider the power of Facebook and its ability to reach an audience. But at the same time, I mean, I also think a lot of video producers are already dealing with 
a major uh, platform that is taking up a lot of their uh, oxygen, which is YouTube, right? But it's so, different because YouTube, you create a show and then you put it on YouTube. You put, YouTube is a distribution medium for you. Facebook, real, and this is why I might disagree with you, Kurt. I think Facebook does want to be a media company. I understand that their business is broader than that. But when you see them paying people, I think they want to incent people to, they want to be, a, they want to be a, the place, the place you go for in information, for entertainment, yeah. for everything. They want to be the platform for internet content for and all in, their users. And in fact, uh, we know most people now get their news on Facebook. So uh, doesn't, I mean, don't you think maybe there's some, why, you said a couple of things that were provocative, I thought, Kurt. One is that Facebook can't keep paying them. Why not? I just don't think that it's sustainable. You know, I, I, I think they got lots of money, don't they? Sure. I, I guess um, perhaps sustainable is wrong. You're right. I mean, they uh, they could continue to pay. I don't think it's good business. So I think what they're going to be inspired to do or, or driven to do is say, OK, now that you've gotten on the platform, you're comfortable with how this works. You've seen the audience that we can drive because we're Facebook. And we should talk about the algorithm, too, because that's a whole nother thing. That, that I think Facebook has, YouTube does some of that, but I think this is Facebook's bread and butter, right? Is that they can basically show you what they wanna show you. So let's set that aside for a second, but you, you get these you know, publishers comfortable going live on Facebook, and then you say, all right, how can we both make money here so that we're not uh, losing money on this, on this content, you know, project, if you will. And they so they already um, said that they're going to yeah. uh, start paying producers for that content. But it's not right. Rolled out well, that's yet. what they're that's what they're doing now. But I think I mean you know, I mean, but revenue split for for uh, for all users as opposed to just paying celebrities. You know what I mean? Well, revenue splits different. So we're going to put that's what YouTube does, right? We're going to put ads on it, and you get some of that money, and we'll get the rest of it. And I think that's what Facebook will ultimately. That's what they want to do too. Yeah, they're doing. Yeah, they haven't. They haven't. I, that's okay. So that's, that might be the distinction between a media company and a social media company, because if you're CBS. You pay people to make content to put on CBS that you could put ads around. Uh, and you couldn't, uh, CBS can't go to Louis C.K. and say, hey, we'll do a rev share with you. We'll get put some ads on there and we'll give you 5%. That's not how it works. Is that, a st I mean, is it a media company if you do that? Yeah, is YouTube a media company? I don't know. Yeah, we, we may be splitting hairs a little bit or, yeah. or at least, you know, identifying how, you know, confusing... This, this whole thing is, yeah. but I think the way I, the slight or subtle difference that I think about is like traditionally Facebook has preached that it's a platform, right? It is not the one creating any of this. Yes, it may be at this point even paying CNN, but it is not coming out and saying we're going to, you know, right. create a new show. They don't want to be Netflix. They don't want to create they originals. Want, right. I think they want to host as much great content as they can because that's where they can sell advertising. But I don't think that they want to be seen as, um, even though we all, you know, again, the algorithm, they choose what we see. They don't want us to think that they choose what they, you know, mm -hmm. we see. They want us to think that everything in our newsfeed is there because it's tailored towards us. And, and, you know, there's an almighty algorithm that picks this for us. But like Facebook is in control of all that. And, and it's very easy to forget that they have a, a, essentially a say in what succeeds and what fails on Facebook. And right now they want live video to succeed. And that's why it's uh, doing so well. Well, wow, that was a lot. We had a lot of fun this year, and we are going to have even more fun in 2017. I want to thank you all so much. Uh, Twit's the first show we started doing in 2005. We're entering our 12th year uh, this year, uh, and the, 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 with more viewers, more listeners, um, your support has been fantastic. Every year it's been growing, and I'm just uh, very grateful personally, and I think I could speak on behalf of our team was also is also growing quite a bit uh when i started twitter it was just me now there's about 25 people who work here uh and and we couldn't do it without you and your support and uh and uh, your listening and your support of our advertisers so thank you very much i hope you've enjoyed this year or last year i guess now it is isn't it i hope you enjoy the new 2017 i promise you lots of great shows all over the network and right here every sunday afternoon 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m eastern time 2300 UTC for this week in tech. We'll have a brand new show for you January 8th. I hope you'll stop by and say hi one week from today. Thanks for being here. And now I guess I have to say it for the 595th time. Sixth? 
five hundred. Good, because Fife makes no sense. For the 596th time, another twit is in the can. Happy New Year. We'll this see you soon. This is amazing. Doing the twit. Doing the twit.